Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, together with Brian Fox from the University of Michigan and on behalf of the uh, Focused Ultrasound Foundation, on behalf of the AIUM, on behalf of our organizing committee, it's our pleasure to welcome you to our fifth session of our cavitation workshop series on detecting, mapping, quantifying double activity in therapeutic ultrasound. Uh, I will give the mic to Brian, who will give a few words of introduction from the AIUM. Well, on behalf of the AIUM and, and the FUSS Foundation, we welcome you to the session today. Um, this is a six-part series. We're on uh, session five of that series. Uh, all of the sessions are recorded, and you can go back into the portal that you're viewing through now and be able to watch any of those sessions over time. Um, this workshop will conclude uh, next week with a summary session, and we invite everybody back uh, who has registered and viewed over time uh, and any new people that might want to join us for that session uh, coming up. So this has been an exciting and interesting series over the last few weeks. We've covered a lot of topics, and um, we want to make sure that we gather all the information that we can as a consequence of the workshop in order to advance the field uh, in the area of monitoring bubble activity for therapeutic ultrasound. Um, so with that, I'll pitch it back to uh, Fred uh, for the introduction of the moderators for today's session. Thank you, Brian. So just a word about uh, logistics. Um, just want to remind you that there is a Q&A uh, panel uh, section on the web page uh, for you to ask questions and post comments. We encourage you to post your questions and comments during the presentation so that they are available uh, for the Q&A. And of course, the Q&A uh, uh, section will be uh, active during the panel discussion, again, for you to post comments and, and questions. So really, we encourage you to participate. Uh, and now I would like to introduce and to thank uh, um, Dr. Alexandra Golby from uh, Harvard Medical School and uh, Keith Ware from the FDA and OCEL for uh, organizing and moderating this, uh, this session. And uh, Dr. Golby will now introduce the, uh, the session. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce Graham Woodworth. Um, I have known Graham for a number of years um, and have um, always assumed that he was older than he was because of his tremendous accomplishments. He is professor and chair um, of the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Maryland. Uh, he has had several clinical uh, and research fellowships in the area of uh, brain tumor neurosurgical oncology. Um, and he has had a deep interest in both laboratory and clinical studies of focused ultrasound, um, especially for, the, for use in patients um, dealing with brain tumors. Um, he is also the PI of a current clinical trial of focused ultrasound. Um, and we're very happy to um, invite him today to speak to us about his experiences. It's a pleasure to join you today for the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine's Future Fund Workshop Series on detecting, mapping, and quantifying bubble activity in therapeutic ultrasound. My name is Graham Woodworth. I'm the Professor and Chair of Neurosurgery at the University of Maryland, and I'm going to be sharing with you some of our clinical experiences and some regulatory considerations related to detecting bubble activity and clinical applications of focused ultrasound. Just to begin, I don't have any disclosures other than some grant funding from the NIH and the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, as well as clinical trials funding from SciTech and the Keith Ponchik Foundation here in Baltimore, Maryland. But as many of you know, there are numerous common uses of ultrasound in clinical practice um, for mostly diagnostic, but also some therapeutic purposes. Here are just a few examples of those that many of you are familiar with. But as we have advanced ultrasound and, and thought about it in new therapeutic applications, the tools have advanced significantly over the last few years. Here's an example of three clinical tools that are actually being uh, explored in clinical trials currently, and some of them are actually being used in uh, reimbursed clinical procedures. The Exoblate Neuro from Incitec is a hemispheric array that covers the majority of the skull and can uh, detect and uh, use ultrasound with multiple different 
uh, transducers and focus the beam within a given um, region of interest. The Carthera uh, Wasan Cloud device is an implantable ultrasound system that can be accessed transcutaneously and activated and um, positioned over an area of interest, such as a brain tumor, resection cavity, or other areas of interest. And more recently, the NAVI FUS transducer system, which is an image guided, stereotactically uh, focused system that uh, can be directed around the, the skull to uh, select the target and, and also leverage as image guidance. In addition to these new tools, we're beginning to learn more and more about the different modes of ultrasound <clears throat> and the biological effects that these modes can generate. Ultrasound can swing between thermal modes to mechanical modes and different power settings can generate different effects such as pulsed uh, disruption of tissues or um, elements within the tissues uh, such as blood or calcified elements uh, similar to the clinical application of um, lithotripsy and histotripsy. And the thermal modes of ultrasound can be used to from thermally ablate or prime tissues with hyperthermia and the clinical application of that currently is focused ultrasound for essential tremor. And, and based on these different modes of ultrasound, many have envisioned different applications for therapeutic purposes, including thermal ablation, as mentioned before, radio sensitization, sonodynamic therapy, activation of sonosensitive agents within tissues, blood brain barrier disruption, ultrasound assisted drug delivery, and immunomodulation. And there are others as well. So the big question has come, if we're thinking about these different modes of ultrasound and the broad potential of the bioeffects of these different modes of ultrasound, how do we gauge these effects in real time in a patient? And these are two examples of, of ways to monitor the effect of ultrasound in the brain or in the body using MRI guidance, uh, MR thermometry, which can measure temperature changes real time, which is a huge advance for measuring and monitoring the thermal effects of ultrasound. Or more recently, the ability to insert and use hydrophones within the ultrasound system to measure the acoustic emissions coming out of a mechanical treatment uh, where there may not be much temperature change at all. And it's in this mode of ultrasound, often with the microbial enhancement in the circulating bloodstream within the region of interest that the mechanical ultrasound effects can be gauged and monitored using acoustic emissions feedback. So such systems with tight control, targeting, and beam steering, in addition to uh, a monitoring framework, whether that's through MRI or hydrophones, create the ability to develop closed feedback loops to understand, plan, treat, and test throughout the treatment and oftentimes within each second within treatments to gauge the, the uh, ultrasound energy delivery in while monitoring real time the effects and in some cases the energy out. And it's this ability to create these closed feedback loops which has really advanced ultrasound into the clinical practice. And I would say that the early uh, FDA approval of MRI guided focused ultrasound for essential tremor are very much hinged on the ability to create such closed feedback loops for safety and efficacy. So when we think about micro bubble enhanced focus ultrasound, we have to think about different ways to monitor the mechanical effects in most cases, um, which are derived from the oscillation, the stable oscillation, in some cases, unstable oscillation and cavitation of these micro bubbles in the bloodstream. In addition, when we think about the regulatory environment, certainly in the United States, and in some cases elsewhere, there are some tight considerations related to different agents being used during ultrasound treatments. In our case here in the United States, when we first discussed microbubble enhanced focus ultrasound with the FDA, they considered the currently approved microbubble formulations, one uh, example being Definity, microbubbles from Lanthius Medical Imaging, but that microbubble formulation, while it was being used throughout the country in many patients every day for diagnostic purposes, was considered 
initially a new drug in the setting of the focused ultrasound tool. So that added a, a wrench into the consideration of how to begin to develop this technology for certain therapeutic applications, such as enhancing drug, drug delivery or considering other combination treatments. So when we thought about that and we tried to discuss, think about a way to advance the, the focus ultrasound tools with, the, with that caveat of the microwaves themselves being an additive potential drug consideration with the ultrasound, um, we began to think about ways to decouple the uh, accuracy, the efficacy, and the safety and monitoring so that we could move this technology into the clinic. Here's an example of one of the early clinical trials. This is the clinical trial where mic bubble enhanced focus ultrasound is used in patients during standard chemotherapy. And these patients are those with high grade brain cancer, um, glioblastoma. And these patients receive a chemotherapy called temozolomide every month for five days with 23 days off in between. And it's during that week of chemotherapy that ultrasound is, is delivered in, in the first day or two of the five-day cycle. And here you can see a um, map of target subspots within a region surrounding a glioblastoma resection cavity. And it's these target subspots that the focus ultrasound system can steer through and apply energy while listening back and gauging the effect at a given subspot geometric location. So in B, you can see the pre-focused ultrasound contrast enhanced image with minimal surrounding contrast enhancement. Um, and there is some surrounding T2 hyperintensity suggestive of infiltrative tumor surrounding this resection cavity. During and after the treatment, we see the, these acoustic energy maps, which can be overlaid on the MRI scan during the treatment. And you can see the relative heterogeneity of the energy deposition within the selected target region and this is the system trying to deliver a, a uniform dose of energy within this entire target region, but uh, being constrained by the controller and the power settings that are uh, set by the, by the operator. Following the treatment, we get a contrast enhanced MRI scan. We can see, um, again, a heterogeneous representation of new contrast enhancement within the targeted regions surrounding this resection cavity. So much of this system is, is derived from this acoustic emissions feedback monitoring system that is listening to the spectra of, of acoustic energy coming back out after the, the energy is delivered during the ultrasound treatment. And this system that I've described to you here is the Insightech Exoplate system. And the monitoring system is actually based on the subharmonic level there noted at the bottom within the spectra. This spectra was generated from um, some preclinical studies with Definity microwaves in a very similar ultrasound transducer system. So here's an example of what this looks like real time during one of the treatments where a patient is receiving uh, ultrasound energy with microwaves in the circulation and there's a target region drawn here surrounding the resection cavity. The system is cycling the power and listening to the acoustic emissions coming out and not allowing the power to get too high to, that could potentially be dangerous, but also trying to generate a certain subharmonic intensity that is correlates with blood brain barrier disruption. So over approximately 90 second interval here, the system performs this treatment and cycles the energy to accomplish the desired total dose called either cavitation or harmonic dose. And that again is set by the operator. You can see the energy being deposited within this target region over the course of this 90 second treatment. So when we look at the energy maps and the calculated cavitation or harmonic doses within these energy maps, we can begin to correlate the energy deposited with a given region with the new enhancement within that region to begin to suggest whether there is a um, dose response to a given biological effect, in this case, a, a new binding on the MRI scan. So here we can correlate a relatively low harmonic dose, a medium harmonic dose, and a higher harmonic dose region and begin to assess and calculate 
the percentage of new contrast enhancement within these regions. So this is an exciting opportunity to begin to think about actually prescribing doses of energy within target regions to uh, achieve a, a desired biological effect. So again, like with the MR thermometry and the ablative applications of focus ultrasound in the setting of microbial enhanced focus ultrasound, we can begin to think about these closed feedback loops and again, dosing to a given biological effect in a similar way. Well, this is an exciting time to begin considering combining a given acoustic dose in such a way um, calculated based on acoustic emissions monitoring with a prescribed therapeutic dose of a desirable drug in a given uh, disease or target region within the brain. So in summary, um, focused ultrasound is a, it's a highly tunable energy modality, which has numerous potential therapeutic applications. And notably, closed loop systems based on imaging and acoustic emissions feedback monitoring are likely to enable greater control of energy, prescribed doses, and tuning of desired biological effects. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm excited to uh, discuss many of these ideas with you in the panel to follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham. Uh, that was really a um, wonderful introduction to the clinical challenges and opportunities of this technology. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Timothy Zemlowitz, uh, who's Associate Professor of Radiology uh, in, at the University of Wisconsin. Um, assistant Residency Program Director and Associate Professor in the sectional, section of Abdominal Imaging and Intervention. Uh, and Tim is going to speak to us about clinical experiences with hi histotripsy. I'm Tim Zimovich from the University of Wisconsin. I'd like to thank the meeting organizers for inviting me to speak on a clinical experience with histotripsy. And I'd also like to thank all of the other workshop presenters over the course of the previous weeks and today for really excellent talks, uh, which have allowed me to learn so much about the cavitation detection monitoring and mapping. These are my disclosures. So we'll start off talking about the prostate. So there was a study performed uh, that was published back in 2018 uh, for the treatment of benign prostatic hypoplasia using the Laborda XRX system by Histosonics. Um, it was noted in this uh, study where they treated 25 patients with BPH was that symptoms did decrease uh, from screening over out to six months. Um, however, the, bulk, the bulking was not observed, and this was postulated to be related to the transperineal approach as compared to the transabdominal approach that was done preclinically. Um, one significant adverse event was noted, which was urinary retention for eight days uh, after the procedure, which is not unexpected uh, for prostate interventions. Um, so overall, the trial was successful in uh, improving symptoms, um, but unfortunately, we didn't get that expected to, to bulking. Um, and uh, if there are further questions on the, the prostate, I know Jen Canada will be in the panel discussion at the, the end of this, and he can provide uh, more details about the uh, prostate treatment. Uh, most of this talk is going to focus on the liver. That's the uh, area that uh, I've been involved with and have the, the most knowledge of. And uh, so we're going to start off talking about liver ablation. Uh, liver ablation is very well defined uh, in the treatment algorithms for various diseases, um, one of them being HCC, where the hepatocellular carcinoma, where the treatment guidelines uh, predominantly used are the BCLC guidelines, which have been around for many years, most recently published in 2018. Um, you can see ablation has a defined role, both for very early stage disease, tumors less than two centimeters, as well as uh, tumors up to three centimeters or, or multiple tumors when patients cannot get uh, surgery. Um, ablation also has a defined role for uh, metastatic colorectal cancer to the liver, where it's said that ablative techniques can be considered alone or in conjunction with surgical resection, um, and all sites of disease should be treated. And we use uh, ablation very routinely clinically for colon cancer. Uh, this is the NCCN guideline for that, but there, there's also uh, ablations in the guidelines for multiple other uh, forms of metastatic disease uh, to the liver. Um, and our current standard is uh, thermal ablation, and we use microwave ablation, and that's becoming the predominant treatment modality. Um, it's mostly replaced radiofrequency ablation in the U.S., although radiofrequency ablation is still used many places. Uh, some places we use cryoablation as well in the liver. And to give an idea what this looks like, this is the very beginning of a gas cloud formation, which is just boiling water uh, at the microwave emission site point along this needle. 
the tumor is this hypoechoic uh, area of the red arrow. And what you'll see is this bubble cloud starts to go, grow, and the treatment effect is visible. Um, but the problem is, as it's growing, the deep margin becomes obscured, so it's hard for us to monitor exactly what's going on. And the truth be told, uh, not everybody monitors their ablations with ultrasound. There's many uh, places where the, the needle is placed with CT, and absolutely no monitoring is done. And the problem that we have with this is there is some treatment variability. It's uh, all of what we know and, and what's uh, what's available as far as what we should expect is based on ex vivo treatment data. And so with one antenna, I could expect a two and a half centimeter uh, ablation zone. But in reality, I can get up to a three and a half centimeter ablation zone in the right setting or sometimes under a two centimeter uh, with the ablation zone. Um, and so there's really some variability that uh, that's caused some clips, causes some clinical limitations. The technique is also imperfect. Uh, local recurrence rates uh, at the best are around five to seven percent, um, and even in experienced hands, can be up to forty percent for treating certain metastatic diseases. So we definitely have some improvement that could be done, and that's why our group has been very interested in hepatic histotripsy and uh, helping to continue translating this technology uh, developed at the University of Michigan into clinical practice. And so for hepatic histotripsy, for the clinical experience, it's really the Teresa study at this point. Uh, which is a phase one study of safety and efficacy performed by uh, Joan Vidal Jove as the PI and Xavier Serres as a site PI at Valdebrun Hospital in Barcelona, Spain, um, as well as Mutual Terrassa Hospital where Joan Vidal Jove was treating patients. Um, and they recruited uh, and treated all the patients within this trial. So the purpose of this trial was to conduct the first inhuman study to evaluate the safety and short-term efficacy of hepatic histotripsy in patients with primary or metastatic liver cancer to determine the viability for larger trials. Um, and the trial design it was a phase one open label non-randomized trial where the primary endpoint was technical success, which was really the ability to create a treatment zone per the planned treatment volume on MR one day post procedure. Secondary endpoints were safety, local tumor control. Did we have a significant effect on liver function? Uh, how did the treatment zone involute? Um, and uh, was there significant pain? Uh, the key inclusion exclusion criteria. So we had to be able to visualize the tumor from a subcostal approach and have continuous visualization of the tumor during treatment. Uh, patient could not be eligible for another curative treatment. Um, and they had to be able to tolerate general anesthesia. And in general, their liver function had to be good. Um, or at least reasonable to undergo the treatment. Uh, we excluded patients where the treatment volume would overlap a second tumor, where laboratory values were significantly abnormal at baseline, uh, those with life expectancy less than six months, uh, and uh, severe liver disease. So what occurred in this trial, so each patient underwent a screening visit within one week prior to the histotripsy. They underwent the histotripsy procedure and then went follow-up visits at one day, one week, one month, and two months post-procedure. At each time point, they had a clinic visit, labs, and an MRI, which was evaluated by a central reader. The first patient, so I'll just kind of run through a couple of patient examples first and then give the overall results of the trial. So the first patient was an 87-year-old female with multifocal hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, the hepatocellular carcinoma is hyper-enhancing on the early phase MR, which we see at the yellow arrow here. The bright spot is the hepatocellular carcinoma we're going to treat. Uh, the orange over here actually points to the pancreas, uh, and the pancreas is on the very backside of the liver in the region we're going to treat. If I was performing a microwave ablation in this case, I would strongly consider putting in some fluid using some hydrodissection to displace that structure so that we didn't cause any damage to the pancreas. Uh, what did this look like with the, the treatment device? So this is the ultrasound at the beginning. Uh, you can see the tumor between the yellow arrows as a hypoechoic area. Uh, we also have an overlying vessel, which serves as a good landmark for the location of the tumor. Uh, when we put the water bath in place, the tumor is still here at the top of the blue arrow. Uh, we have that vessel as the, the landmark. Uh, and we planned our treatment with this uh, with this circle here, uh, the orange arrow surrounds the tumor, the red arrow is the plant mar or the red circle, sorry, is the plant margin. Um, and we plan to run it within a couple millimeters of the edge of the liver with the pancreas being down uh, here. And again, here's the pancreas at the red arrow. The purple is really just at a couple of millimeter margin we want at the end of the liver. Um, and like I said, using other modalities, uh, I would potentially try to move the edge of the liver away from uh, pancreas or other critical structures, but I knew based on our preclinical work that uh, with this uh, uh, this planned treatment, this is what we were going to get. So we did the treatment, and as expected, we had very well-defined ablation zone, very small margin, just as planned here at that purple arrow. Uh, the ablation zone went right up to this uh, vessel uh, right above it. The vessel's patent. 
Uh, the ablation zone is well defined, and this correlated very well with our preclinical work, where we had very well defined ablation zones uh, in, in swine and with very sharply demarcated uh, treatment uh, edges of the treatment zone, uh, which is very equivalent to what we see on the, here on the MR, this non enhancing area, very well defined separately from the enhancing normal liver. Uh, what other things did we see? So this is a contrast enhanced ultrasound one day post where we see some patent blood vessels running through the middle. This is something that just doesn't occur with, uh, with microwave ablation or some of our other treatment modalities. Um, but this is something that we also noted preclinically and granted this is a bile duct, but this is a similar kind of idea, collagen containing structures, bile duct patent within the treatment zone, excreted contrast coming through the, that patent bile duct. And pathologically, we know it bile duct intact with complete necrosis running right up to it. So we were confident that we were gonna get cellular kill right up to the edge of the bile duct, even some partial necrosis on the far side of it right at the margin there. Uh, when we overlaid a, a post-treatment MR with our planning ultrasound image, this is our plan and you can see this non-enhancing tissue very well correlating with exactly what we planned with some elongation on the cranial caudal plane, which is what we expect from respiratory motion. Uh, but this level of precision is just something that we don't get with our uh, currently available treatment modalities. Uh, another example, a 56-year-old male with metastatic colorectal cancer, he was progressing after multiple lines of chemotherapy, uh, experiencing neurotoxicity from chemotherapy, which unfortunately uh, is relatively common. Uh, and so here's a nice example of the tumor at the yellow arrow. The orange arrow is a vessel pointing to it, which we have as a nice landmark. Um, so well-defined tumor, again, when we look at these blue and red arrows, we've got the abdominal wall and the stomach in very close proximity. If I was performing a microwave ablation here, I would put fluid in to create some space between these structures to minimize chances of injuring them. But again, with the, the precision that we were, have been provided with histotripsy, uh, we can confidently place an ablation in this space without having to perform adjunctive maneuvers. And so to give an idea of uh, what this looked like, this is just a reformat uh, of the MR image. So you can see the tumor here with that vessel running up to it, uh, what we might expect to see with ultrasound. Uh, and this is exactly what we see with ultrasound. Here's the, the tumors within this uh, orange circle. The planned margin is the, the red circle. We're going right up to the edges of the liver uh, anteriorly here and right on the posterior aspect of the liver here at the purple arrow. Uh, and in real time, what does this look like? So this visualization that we have of the bubble cloud and the treatment effect, we don't get with other modalities, right? We saw with microwave ablation, but it's continuously growing and we lose and obscure the deep margin. Here we have continuous visualization of the treatment effect, which we just don't get with any other modality. Uh, and so what did this result in? Again, a very well-defined non-enhancing treatment uh, with enhancing liver, just a thin margin, both posteriorly and anteriorly. Just what we planned is exactly what we got. Again, there's elongation from breathing between these orange arrows and that cranial caudal plane. Uh, but this uh, level of precision, we just don't get with the other modalities that we have. Um, so overall, what, uh, uh, what did we result with? So we had eight patients who were treated in the trial. Uh, 11 total tumors, a majority of them colorectal metastases, uh, also treated gallbladder and breast cancer metastases, as well as one patient with hepatocellular carcinoma. The primary endpoint uh, was achieved in 100% of the, the treatments. Uh, we were able to create the planned treatment volume. Um, prescribed versus achieved, this is the, the thing for me that's the, one of the most exciting things about this technology. In preclinical studies, we were within a couple of millimeters of what we prescribed. Again, like I talked about with microwave ablation, this can be variable up to a centimeter of difference. Um, uh, and we got within a couple of millimeters preclinical and clinically we actually ended up spot on and prescribed is what we got with some expected elongation in the cranial caudal plane. Uh, what other results? So local control, we did have two tumors classified as progression. One of them was really just a, a mistargeting, uh, and this is an, an area for continued research is how do we better target these. Uh, but this one was a very small tumor uh, that we used landmarks to target and just caught the edge up, so that progressed. The other one is classified as a progression, but really it's just tumor growing adjacent to it. We really can't tell if it's progressed or not, so it was classified as progression. Um, what other things do we know? So liver function, as expected, one day post, there was an uh, increase in liver function tests. Uh, this happens with any uh, ablation, any treatment we do to the liver. Uh, there's going to you kill some normal liver cells. There's going to be a change in the liver function test, but that normalized at one week, which is equivalent to what we see with our uh, microwave and radiofrequency ablations. 
post ablation syndrome uh, tends to happen when we treat uh, larger volumes of microwave or radio frequency and cryoablation, uh, where patients get low grade fever and fatigue lasting less than one week. Uh, this did occur in one patient where we treated three total tumors. Serious adverse events, there were none that were device related. The only two serious adverse events were a fever related to a dental abscess uh, 31 days post procedure and hypocalcemia in a patient who had underlying Crohn's disease 22 days post procedure. Uh, and this was attributed by the, the treating uh, hospital team. Uh, secondary, another secondary endpoint, involution. So at eight weeks, uh, we had involution on average of 72% by volume. This uh, far outstrips anything that we get with microwave uh, cryo radio frequency ablation, which should allow us to identify any local progression much earlier on. And here you can see the significant reduction of this treatment zone over the course of eight weeks. And this matched what we saw preclinically. So in summary for Teresa, the Teresa study demonstrated technical success in all treatments with no device related serious adverse events. Uh, the plan versus achieved treatments on alignment, preservation of vessels, and the treatments on involution were all consistent with what we saw in our preclinical work. Um, and these results supported moving to larger human studies. Um, and so currently, what do we have on this ongoing hope for liver trials in both the US and Europe, uh, which is actively recruiting. And if anyone knows of any patients with uh, liver tumors, we'd be interested in that trial, let me know and I can get them in touch with the treatment site. Um, what would I like to see in the near future? I would like to see uh, kidney treatments, thyroid treatments, and then combination with amino therapies. Two of the patients in the uh, Teresa study did have uh, off-target response, so tumors that uh, uh, were not treated actually did show some level of response. Um, and uh, Cliff Cho and the group at the University of Michigan done a lot of work on uh, showing that there is an immunologic effect. And so combination with immunotherapies is an exciting area for growth uh, for this technology. So as far as uh, monitoring um, and the purpose of this workshop, it's really hard to be direct visualization. I think whenever that's available, that should be the, the primary modality is directly visualized with BMOD ultrasound. Um, cavitation detection is definitely going to have a role, especially when visualization is obstructed um, and when we're in proximity to, to critical structures. So if we want to do treatment central in the liver, uh, we maybe probably want to monitor dose to see if we can treat the, uh, and spare some of those central structures uh, while still getting an adequate treatment of the tumor. So I'd like to acknowledge a large team that uh, has taken to, to get this to clinical reality, including uh, Joan Fidel Jovey and Jack Serres, who uh, recruited all the patients in Barcelona. The team at the University of Michigan has really pushed this technology forward, uh, including Jenju and Tim Hall, um, and then uh, uh, multiple other collaborators uh, who have helped really push this technology to clinical use. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for that presentation. Um, our next speaker um, will be introduced by Dr. Keith Ware. Uh, was there going to be any question and answer for the last presentation? So do we have any questions? I see a question here in the chat that I can uh, answer. So the one of the questions is, do you have a real-time metric to assess the efficacy of histotripsy treatment um, that you've effectively ablated the intended area? Uh, and we do have uh, that metric, which is that bubble cloud that we see. Um, and what we know with intrinsic threshold histotripsy, which is uh, what this uh, treatment modality uses, uh, is that the that uh, bubble cloud correlates with an area where we're getting cell death. Uh, and the the treatment effect, you could see it's uh, somewhat as it went through, there's an automated uh, treatment effect or an automated uh, movement of the, the therapy transducer through that planned volume. Um, and so as long as we're continuously getting bubble cloud, we're continuously getting treatment effect. Um, and so that's how we monitor it in, in real time uh, with this intrinsic threshold dystotripsy, which is uh, what we were using. Um, as far as, uh, when we have something like visualization blocked at this point in time, we don't have a, a definitive way to monitor it, although hopefully in the, uh, in the future we'll be uh, uh, able to have some kind of uh, cavitation de detection similar to what we've been talking about at this workshop for uh, when we're treating through ribs or something like that in the liver. Although I will say we've treated uh, preclinically through ribs and it, it can be done and you can, you can monitor the bubble cloud for the large majority of the, of the procedure. 
Um, another question has to do with the system compensating for respiratory motion. Yeah, and so the system itself uh, at this point in time doesn't compensate for respiratory motion. And so we, when we're planning the procedure out, we account for that by watching the respiratory motion uh, before we start to deliver any treatment. And we can plan to make sure if we're up against critical structures that we're not gonna be crossing them during the course of that respiratory motion. Um, and so that has led to the elongation, but there is a lot of uh, work being done uh, uh, Paul uh, Lisecki in our lab uh, has done uh, a lot of work in uh, evaluating how you can compensate for the respiratory motion by potentially using cone beam CT um, and evaluating what a patient looks like uh, breathing in real time with that. Uh, we also recently published a study where we just changed the ablation prescription instead of it being a sphere. We made it a lens. And when you make a lens and you include the respiratory motion, essentially you end up with a sphere. So uh, there's some things that can be done both on the, this relatively simple side of making that lens um, and then the more complex side, which is probably how the future will be of kind of anticipating and uh, evaluating the patient's respiratory motion in real time. Um, do we have time for another question? So the last question is, uh, it seems like a great use of contrast enhanced ultrasound for post-treatment monitoring. Do you expect this to be a recommendation for future use? Uh, it's possible it, it could be for, for future use. What I'll say is uh, we can see the actual treatment area pretty well, even without contrast in its ultrasound. Um, that being said, uh, it does provide a, a nice visualization, a really nice evaluation uh, of the uh, entire tumor. Um, and so it will probably be one of the things used uh, I, as a uh, someone who's very bent towards cross-sectional imaging and do a lot of CT and MR reading, uh, that'll probably continue to be a, a mainstay of how we evaluate post as well. But the nice thing about contrast and ultrasound is that we can use it uh, in real time, especially if you don't have access. But when we perform our microwave ablations and probably going forward as we perform these histotripsy procedures, we actually do them in a suite where we have a CT scanner available. So we just do that immediately post. And it just gives you a little bit more three-dimensional view. Do you think there's any role for functional imaging, such as PET, to uh, confirm the ablation of the tissue? So there potentially is. Again, like that would be in a, a hybrid suite, uh, somewhere that we have a CT. There are some sites that do that for ablations currently, uh, although those are a relatively limited number of sites. So it's somewhat cost prohibitive. So there may be a point in time where the, the economics work out that you can tie up a PET CT scanner and, uh, and use this uh, and do the evaluation potentially in real time. I think we should uh, probably move on to the next speaker and introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And uh, my name is Keith Ware. I'm a research physicist at the US Food and Drug Administration. And I'd like to thank the AIUM uh, and the Focused Ultrasound Foundation for sponsoring this great series of webinars. And in particular, Brian Folks and Frederick Padilla for uh, inviting me to uh, participate. So um, now we're going to transition from the clinical talks to the more uh, technical talks. And the first one will be given by Yuxi Huang, who is a research associate at the Sunnybrook Research Institute in Toronto, Canada. He received a PhD in medical biophysics from the University of Toronto in 2007. He is currently a research associate in the focused ultrasound lab at Sunnybrook Research Institute, primarily working as a physicist in various clinical trials of MR-guided focused ultrasound therapy. So please start the video. Hi, my name is Yue Xi Huang. I work at Clever Highlands Lab at Sandbrook. In the past 10 years or so, I have been working as a physicist uh, in clinical trials, especially with inside brain systems. Here, I will share some of our experience using the systems, especially from a technical and practical perspective. In an earlier session, Itai from InsideTech gave a very good overview of technical capabilities of their systems on cavitation detection and control. Following the three categories of applications, at Sandybrook, 
we have treated over 250 patients on thermal ablations, uh, mostly in central tremor, OCD, and depression. We have also performed over 150 BBB treatments using the 230 system uh, in multiple trials on GBM, uh, breast mice, ALS, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. In addition, we have treated 12 tremor patients using echofocusing. If we compare these three applications on cavitation control, at this point, uh, on the engineering level, probably echo focusing is the most advanced. But if we consider the outcome, a BBB is the most challenging one because the cavitation level needs to be related uh, to a variety of bio effects. First, I will use just one slide to describe cavitation control in thermal ablation. As Itai has mentioned, uh, there are eight cavitation receivers at the current system. Uh, both a narrow band at the subharmonic and two broad bands uh, were used to calculate the spectral integration. Uh, if cavitation happens, the cavitation controller first decreases power to suppress cavitation activity, then tries to ramp back to full power so that the full acoustic energy can be delivered by adding a few extra seconds. But if cavitation is too strong, as the example on the right shows, the power may not be able to come back, so full energy cannot be reached. If this happens, well, we normally first double check the gas level and make sure no bubble trap on a membrane folds. And then the software defines two types of tissues with different levels of cavitation thresholds. So by choosing the one with higher level can reduce the chance of power modulation. If nothing worked, we still can lower the power and increase the duration as long as 50 to 60 seconds to achieve the energy level. So practically as a safety feature for thermal ablations, cavitation Cavitation control uh, works sufficiently with the current setup. The PPB cavitation control, on the other hand, uh, went through quite a few changes over time. Uh, the first BBB treatment was in 2015. At that time, because technical and regulatory restrictions, we were not able to use the 10 second per second pulse as used in most preclinical studies. A pulse train was designed consisting of shorter pulses with higher PRF, but the overall duty cycle of each subspot in the 3 by 3 grid was similar to the 10 millisecond pulse. The microbrop dose was 4 microliter per kilogram for every bolus injection. Uh, this was based on testing on a transhuman skull pig study in which we found that with a lower dose of 2 microliter per kilogram, cavitation signals were more sporadic and BVV opening was less consistent. At the time, the total microbrop dose limit was still 20 microliter per kilogram based on the definitive label. Therefore, we could only do five bolus injections. And at that time, the optimal power was determined by short sonications at different power levels, in this case at 5, 7, 9 watts, until the cavitation magnitude was close to the expected level at 9 watts. At both locations we sonicated, there were clear GAD enhancement of grid patterns, but there were also T2-star signals uh, indicating red blood cell extravasation, suggesting the need for more precise control of the power. To achieve that, a ramp sonication was designed. Uh, this was to mimic the way Megan O'Reilly uh, suggested in her paper by ramping up power until stable cavitation is detected, then drop pressure by 50%. Uh, with practical limitations, the ramp could only do uh, 11 power levels, uh, in this example from 5 watt to 10 watt with half watt step size. On the left was a baseline ramp without microbubble. You can see there's a small but power-dependent baseline noise from the system. Uh, with microbubble, cavitation signals clearly increased from the baseline until it triggered a safety threshold level, in this case at 8.5 watt. Initially, to mimic Megan's paper, we used the lowest power level that started to see the cavitation increase, in this case it was 5 watt, so we dropped power by 50% and sonicated at 2.5 watt. As there's not much detectable cavitation activities above the baseline level uh, in the BBB sonication. And in this case, we actually repeated the sonication at 2.5 watts three times for a total of 300 seconds uh, with three boluses of microbubbles, because after the first and second time, uh, there's no obvious GAD enhancement until the third time GAD was observed. So this case shows that BBB can be opened at cavitation level below the baseline level of the system, uh, but may need a longer sonication duration. 
So to improve the treatment efficiency, uh, we later use the power level that trigger the safety threshold as a reference. If we use this case as an example, we would drop power from 8.5 watt by 50% and sonic it at about 4 watt. With that, there usually is a low level of computation signals during the BBB sonication, but in most cases, we could see gut enhancement after 100 seconds without T2 star signals. Then in 2019, there was a major software upgrade by InsideTech, which enabled sonicating larger grids up to 32 subspots with 10 millisecond pulses. It also added computation dose mapping, so computation dose at each subspot was spatially displayed. It's worth to clarify that the computation mapping was not in the same sense as passive acoustic mapping or bubble imaging, because there were only still only eight receivers with limited mapping capability. It just assumed at a certain time point, when sonicating at a certain subspot, the detected computation signal all came from that subspot, and the software plot the accumulated computation dose at the exact subspot and use a mass model to determine the 3D expansion from the center of that subspot. So although this is not real computation mapping, it's still a big improvement from the LAN plots before and provided useful spatial information. So in terms of power control, the new software still allows to use RAM sonication as before. But compared to uh, the case 3x3 and 2x3 grids, in which we use either the center spot or the corner spot for the RAM, for a larger grid, the ramp spot can be very far in distance from other subspots. So in this example, we put the ramp at the relatively center of the grid, but those was quite inhomogeneous. So we stopped using the ramp sonication and switched to the feedback controller uh, also came with the upgrade. With the feedback controller, a computation dose target was first defined empirically. Then based on the sonication duration, the controller will try to modulate power to maintain the cavitation magnitude at the appropriate level. Of course, the underlying assumption is that there are detectable cavitation signals during the BUB sonication. So this implementation controls the average dose over the grid rather than the dose of each subspot, I guess, to make the power modulation relatively smooth. To better use this feedback controller with a more steady microbubble concentration, we also switched from bolus injection to gravity drip infusion. Uh, microbubble infusion dose was set at 4 microliter per kilogram for every 5 minutes to be consistent with uh, bolus injection. We also received the approval for a higher total microbubble dose of 150 microliter per kilogram. Uh, which allows for about three hours of continuous infusion and treatment. Up to now, the highest dose we used was about 140 microliter per kilogram in a GBM patient with a very large tumor. Because the feedback controller controls average dose rather than uh, individual subspots, uh, sometimes there's still significant dose in homogeneity over the grid. Uh, we often use manual controls to improve the dose dis distribution. In this case, we manually stop the sonication at 50 seconds when three subspots already reached the targeted dose, then remove the three subspots and continue. So uh, at together, all four separate sonications, the dose was more or less evenly distributed over the grid. Of course, this workaround was not ideal because for the first three subspots, for example, they reached the dose at 50 seconds. Uh, rather than the intended 120 seconds, which means the cavitation magnitude was more than doubled than intended. It's an open question if a cavitation dose was a linear model between the magnitude and duration, but this is the best we can do for now. As I know, a new controller with subspot power control has been developed, and we are looking forward to testing the new controller soon. The computation dose target was so far empirical, and we also observed location, tissue type, and interpatient variability for the dose target. Uh, for the putamium target in Parkinson's patient, which was at the relatively central volume of the brain, we found the ideal dose target was more or less consistent among patients. But for multiple targets in Alzheimer's patients, we found if we use the same dose for all targets at the hippocampus, the anterior cingulate, and the precuneus, the pecuniary target at the posterior volume and the medial portion of the anterior cingulate tend to have T2-star signals. We ended up using slightly different dose target for different locations, and it worked better. Uh, 
and a much larger variability was observed among tumor patients. And in general, it was more difficult to see gut enhancement in inflammatory tissues. This needs to be understood better. Lastly, uh, for eco-focusing, the detailed algorithm was not disclosed. But as we understand, it's based on microbubble imaging uh, with all 1024 transmit elements in receive mode. The implementation greatly simplified and streamlined the process. Uh, briefly, it starts with CT-based phasing at low power with a very low dose of microbubble infusion. And when a significant number of bubble events were detected at a certain power level, it calculates a focusing score for the new phasing and calculates a similarity score compared to the old phasing. Then this process was iterated until both a high focusing score and a high similarity score are achieved. The Ran Jones also worked as an operator in this trial and published a paper summarizing our results. In the graph, although the CT-based phasing and echo focusing look similar, if you subtract the two, the red, pink, and yellow colors indicate elements with large phase differences. And in general, uh, echo focusing uh, significantly improved power efficiency compared to uh, CT phasing. Ryan will be on the discussion panel today, and he can discuss more about this. In summary, for the three applications, cavitation control in thermal ablation works effectively, and uh, eco-focusing is promising to improve the power efficiency. The main interest would be to expand the treatment envelope for more off-center targets. For the BBB application, although significant progress has been made, there are still many unanswered questions. On the technical level, I'm uh, optimistic that with the implementation of new techniques has been approved working well in preclinical studies, we will have more precise control on cavitation activities. On the clinical level, uh, the responses of different tissue types and the limit of drug concentration can be achieved at the various targets still need to be better understood. Finally, I would like to acknowledge a large clinical team at Sandy Brook, led by Dr. Neil Lipsman, and thank InstaTech for technical support and FAST Foundation for coordinating all the trials. Thank you. Okay, well, that was a very interesting talk, and it triggered uh, a lot of questions in the chat line. Um, the most popular one being so far. What is the metric derived from the passive cavitation detection measurements? to characterize the cavitation level during the thermal ablation, how was the safety threshold defined? Well, that's a good question. The safety threshold uh, was defined by the company. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, I guess based on some uh, their uh, experience in some early uh, patient studies uh, and also some animal studies. I think the, the threshold basically try to, it's, it's just a, the integration of the uh, spectrum energy. I just uh, make sure below a certain, uh, above a certain energy level, the system power will be reduced. Um, I'm not sure whether that has to be a very precise threshold uh, in terms of correlation to damage because uh, it, it doesn't hurt if we overprotect a little bit. Right? So that's a safety feature. So if you say you have a certain very obvious uh, uh, stable cavitation or even inertial cavitation, uh, you just just reduce the power. Even that will not really 100% sure to induce a, a tissue damage. But as long as you reduce the power and minimize the cavitation and can, can kind of come back, uh, you can avoid the accumulation of the cavitation. It still works. The, the end point is just to make a thermal lesion. So as, I guess in that, since the thermal thresh, the, the threshold, cavitation threshold in thermal ablation uh, doesn't have to be very accurate uh, as long as it's protecting or spun. That's my understanding. Maybe uh, the, the company has a different thought. Okay, great, thanks. Um, another question is, do you have a dedicated system for microbubbles infusion to avoid size filtration over time due to bubble buoyancy? Uh, we don't. Uh, well, for preclinical studies, we do have an infusion, uh, infuser, uh, the MR compatible. Uh, but uh, for the patient clinical trial, we just use the sealing bag. We mix the microbubble with sealing bag and just use the gravity drip uh, for that. 
and they actually worked uh, surprisingly well. Uh, I, I think at the beginning, uh, we tried to mix the bag every like uh, five, 10 minutes to make sure the bubble was evenly distributed in the bag and then uh, continue. But the thing is, every time you mix the bag, uh, uh, there's some delay that the drip rate will fluctuate. So you need to wait for like 30 seconds or a minute to wait till it's stabilized. But later, we just make it longer and longer, sometimes 20 minutes, 30 minutes without any mix. It still works fine, at least from the feedback from the cavitation side. We didn't observe any difference. I guess it's the micro bubble, definitely micro bubble is relatively uniform to start with compared to other micro bubbles. Um, I think this uh, sitting back uh, trip uh, infusion is a very practical and convenient way to do it, especially most of the procedures uh, takes hours to, to finish. And this uh, is a big improvement. Okay, great. Um, another question is, I don't, uh, we have to proceed to the next talk in, in a few minutes, but uh, and we might uh, delay some of your answer of this question to the panel discussion. But one person asked, can you explain more about echo focusing? Well, I guess the, uh, Ryan Jones, he, he's the expert on, on the passive acoustic mapping. He's on the panel. Probably he can explain more about that uh, uh, based on his experience. I, I think I will just skip here on that question. Okay. Um, that's fine. So I think we can uh, proceed to uh, the final talk of, of this morning session. And uh, that will be given by my colleague Shuba Maryuvada at uh, the Food and Drug Administration. She's an acoustics research engineer. She's the program coordinator for the Therapeutic Ultrasound Program in the Division of Applied Mechanics, which is part of the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories at the FDA. Her current areas of research are preclinical characterization of high-intensity therapeutic ultrasound devices, uh, also known as HITU devices, characterization of tissue-mimicking materials for HITU applications, HITU-induced bioeffects, and comparison of acoustics measurements to modeling uh, predictions. She serves as working group convener, primary liaison, and technical expert on several working groups within the International Electrotechnical Commission, uh, Technical Committee 87 on Ultrasonics, and she is the vice president elect of the Acoustical Society of America. So, could you please start uh, the video for Dr. Mariuvada? Hello. My name is Shobha Maravada, and I will be speaking about the regulatory considerations for cavitation detection in therapeutic ultrasound. I'd like to thank the Focus Ultrasound Foundation and AIUM for the invitation to speak with you today. I'm in the Division of Applied Mechanics in the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories within the Center for Devices and Radiological Health at the US FDA. My talk outline is this. I will first discuss regulatory pathways. Um, the very few standards requirements that are in place uh, which concern cavitation, the types of ultrasound devices that generate cavitation, and the regulatory review considerations around cavitation detection, monitoring, and um, prevention of adverse events or therapeutic ultrasound devices. Just to give you an overview of CDRH, uh, we have 1,900 employees who are involved in 22,000 pre-market submissions, including supplements and amendments per year. We work with 18,000 medical device manufacturers, covering 570,000 proprietary brands with 25,000 medical device facilities worldwide. There are 183,000 medical devices on the US market and CDRH receives 1.4 million reports on medical device adverse events and malfunctions a year. The Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories has 183 federal employees with up to 180 visiting scientists. We are involved in 2,500 pre-market regulatory consults per year, depending on our particular expertise. 
We are involved in 140 projects in 20 different program areas of which therapeutic ultrasound is one. We are involved in 75 different standards and conformity assessment committees. 70% of OCEL staff has a postgraduate degree. We disseminate 400 peer-reviewed presentations, articles, and other public disclosures per year. And our lab space covers 55,000 square feet over two buildings. The device industry is made up of many small firms. Devices span a broad array of products, so there are three very different mechanisms to market. The first is class one, where general controls and minimal FDA involvement is needed. Um, examples of class one devices are a tongue depressor or a blood pressure cuff. Class two has two different mechanisms. Um, the pre-market notification or a 510K states that the subject device is similar to an existing regulated device or a de novo where general special controls provide safety and efficacy, but there is no legally marketed predicate that exists. And finally, class three, which requires a pre-market approval application for a high risk or new technology devices where there is a new intended use or there is a new type of safety and effectiveness question. And therapeutic ultrasound devices generally fall under class two or class three. So the differences between these three main mechanisms to market for therapeutic ultrasound devices are the following. A PMA requires preclinical testing to demonstrate safety and to test design and operation, as well as the clinical study to demonstrate safety and effectiveness. The 510K pre-market notification, which states that the, um, the subject device is uh, similar to a predicate requires demonstration of equivalence to the predicate via preclinical testing. A small number of 510Ks do contain clinical study data. And finally, the de novo classification is a newer risk-based classification process. Preclinical testing is required to demonstrate safety and to test design and operation. There likely needs to be a clinical study to demonstrate safety and effectiveness as well as general controls or general and special controls, which much must be indicated to provide reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness for intended use. And for all of these, the clinical study um, protocol and um, such are determined uh, via conversations between um, the medical officers and CDRH and the device sponsors. So cavitation with respect to medical ultrasound devices has the following technical considerations. Um, cavitation microbubble formation is largely unpredictable. Accurate knowledge of the location of a cavitation event is crucial for safety determination. And the formation of prefocal bubble clouds can block focus and thus impede uh, treatment efficacy. Cavitation is avoided in many ultrasound applications such as clinical diagnostic imaging, in lithotripsy when shielding occurs um, that may block the energy getting to the kidney stone and in high two for many cases. However, it is useful in some ultrasound applications, again in lithotripsy where cavitation actually helps to break the stones, in histotripsy where cavitation is, is one of the important uh, modes of, of action, and in high two blood-brain barrier neuromodulation applications where again stable cavitation is an important mode of action for treatment. As many of the speakers have indicated, there are no guidances or standards devoted to cavitation detection methods for therapeutic ultrasound. However, there is mention of cavitation in IEC 60601-2-62 which is the safety and essential performance standard for HI2 equipment. This standard states that cavitation shall be monitored and indicated based on dry voltage, ultrasound echo, or another tool like an MRI. Manufacturers shall address risks associated with bubble formation all along the acoustic path, notably at the surface of the transducer, the transducer tissue interface, and the region of interest. And manufacturers shall address the risks of unintended cavitation effects on tissue, especially in sensitive tissues such as lungs, the GI tract, or the eye. There is another standard. Uh, this comes under IEC T, uh, TC87 Ultrasonics Working Group 3. This is 63001, Measurement of Cavitation Noise in Ultrasonic Baths and Ultrasonic Reactors. And this standard 
describes um, techniques to measure and evaluate cavitation in support of validation efforts for cleaning tanks and cleaning equipment as used, for example, for purposes of industrial process control or for hospital sterilization. So while the safety standard does ask for certain things to be considered where cavitation is a concern, um, there is a standard that, that does deal with cavitation for another application that maybe could be used as a starting point for uh, a cavitation detection for therapeutic ultrasound levels. Cavitation effects are um, important because of the effects they have on the surrounding tissue. The high pressures on surrounding tissue can be quite damaging. High tube bubble creation can produce focal temperatures that are difficult to predict and can also be thermally destructive. The potential adverse effects are that microbubble expansion and collapse can cause the tissue and the cells close to collapse to result in cellular damage, hemorrhage, or hemolysis. And the bubble cloud formation can block acoustic energy needed for effective treatment. I'd like to now get into the regulatory review considerations concerning cavitation equipment and methods, the bench or in vivo study evaluation of cavitation threshold in, in detection, and the engineering mitigations that are asked to be put in place to avoid adverse events. Uh, many speakers have given great talks on the breadth of cavitation detection equipment methods, um, processing and such. This is just a, a summary of what uh, we come across. Um, the most common passive, passive cavitation detector are just the highly sensitive wideband receivers that detect the low amplitude acoustic emissions. They're recording both the acoustic content from stable and inertial uh, cavitation. These PCBs are coaxial, transverse, or at an angle to the high tube beam, depending on the device. They can be focused or unfocused, and they are single element or embedded in the transducer array. Ultrasound imaging is another cavitation detection um, method where B-mode ultrasound is used to monitor bubble activity in real time. Sometimes uh, the ultrasound imaging uh, pulses are interleaved with high two pulses to avoid interference. The two newer cavitation detection methods are passive cavitation mapping where the intensity of cavitation events is quantified and active cavitation mapping where the cavitation bubbles are spatially localized during treatment. So once it is understood what equipment and methods are going to be used to detect cavitation, we look at bench testing. And there are different ways to provide bench testing for cavitation detection. You can use a phantom um, and a PCD to detect acoustic emissions within the phantom. You can embed uh, the phantom with thermocouple to measure thermally significant bubble formation, as well as use ultrasound imaging to monitor cavitation within a clear phantom. Sometimes in vivo studies are also required. Um, the choice of animal model and the choice of detection method are determined by the sponsor and with uh, conversations with, again, the medical officers and CDRH. And the choice of animal model, of course, is dependent on the application for the therapeutic ultrasound device. Then threshold determination is required um, to justify the clinical parameters that will actually be used for treatment. So to deal with the engineering mitigations to avoid AE, we ask the following questions. For detection, we ask if cavitation is expected, what equipment is used to detect cavitation? We ask that the equipment used to detect cavitation be characterized as well as the acoustic parameters be characterized. Monitoring we, monitoring, we ask how will cavitation be monitored if it is going to be used as part of the treatment and what user controls are in place. Um, part of the user controls are also the labeling and how clear is the labeling for the user to use, again, to monitor cavitation effectively. And finally, what mitigations and controls are needed to assure patient safety and treatment efficacy? We ask what controls are in place to avoid adverse events. So the future direction for cavitation detection, at least in the very near future, near future seems to be a need for standardization. Many uh, speakers did um, 
present some great ideas for a starting place. Um, Kevin Hayworth mentioned that there is a need for uniform approaches to reporting methods, including processing codes, practical methods for calibrating systems, development of gold standard techniques to enable comparison of different approaches. Nathan McDonald mentioned that reporting of cavitation detection sensitivity in water or phantom as a baseline could be a place to start. And coming back full circle to our first talk by Kyle Morrison, Kyle mentioned that characterization and calibration of the cavitation detection sensitivity could be developed similar to how hydrophone calibration and characterization standards were developed. Um, I offer up IUCTC 87 Ultrasonics Technical Committee as a possible uh, venue for developing this standard. There are several working groups within IUCTC 87, including working group six, working group seven, eight, and 14, which is the determination of acoustic output parameters. Um, this could be a possible new work item. I recently stepped into the position of, of convener for working group 14, and so that is why I'm kind of putting that out there. But this is something we could definitely discuss amongst the experts who are interested in uh, developing a standard as well as the conveners from these different working groups. And I am happy to, to facilitate that. Um, I think a, lot, a great place to start would just be cavitation detection measurements and equipment for medical ultrasound equipment. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your time and attention and ask if there are any questions. Um, thank you so much and take care. Okay, uh, thank you, Shuba, for that, that nice talk. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat line on the most popular one. And, and this came in before you finished your talk and you kind of touched on these subjects already, but maybe uh, you could elaborate a little bit. Um, that's a long question. If cavitation detection is going to be used for safety or efficacy in a therapeutic device, what type of information would the FDA require to approve or clear that aspect of the device? Would it require a generalizable metric or dose approach? Uh, in other words, something that can be used across devices analogous to how diagnostic machines require mechanical index and thermal index. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> and Keith, um, I'm happy to have you also step in for any of these questions. I would appreciate it. Um, so right now, you know, right this the review of cavitation detection for therapeutic ultrasound devices is done on a case-by-case -case basis. And so um, we look at the, the device, you know, and the application and um, what the sponsor um, presents as the best way to provide cavitation detection monitoring. So it's really right now, um, you know, there's no metrics in place yet. I think the reason for starting some of the standardization is to get to that. I don't think we're there yet, but I do think we are at a place where we can at least say just um, foundationally for cavitation detection, what equipment um, can be used and what, um, what uh, methods can be used. Okay, yeah, th th that's a good answer. I can only echo what, what Shuba just said, as we've seen, there, there's such a variety of applications and technologies that it's hard to give general sweeping answers that, that apply to all devices. Right. <laughs> um, right, but... So uh, another question. Um, there are a lot here. Uh, to sift through. We won't have time for all of them, but we'll get to some in the panel discussion. Will cavitation nucleation agents be treated by the FDA as a drug or as a device? Right. Right. That is a hot topic. And I, you know, all of that, the lawsuit and everything is happening on the drug side. Um, and so that's not really something I think we're just, we're all waiting as well. So um, yeah, that's not something that I, I feel like I, I can answer <laughs> but i feel like the answer is coming soon <laughs> yeah all that is, is still up in the air um well 
Well, you again, you've kind of touched on this already, but um, do you think that calibration of cavitation detection equipment is a necessity? I honestly, I don't know. I think there have been really great talks that have presented kind of both points of view. And I think that's something that, um, that I think we need to um, figure out as a group. Um, maybe which kind of, you know, in what cases are calibration, is calibration necessary? Um, and when can we use a more comparative approach or a threshold approach that may not require calibration? So um, again, I think that's, that's something that um, will need to be really looked at quite closely, maybe soon. <laughs> and, and with, with members, um, you know, all the different speakers uh, during this workshop. Okay, um, maybe one more question. Uh, can blood brain barrier opening alone without a drug uh, hmm. be regulated as a device? Wow, that um, is something I would definitely have to defer to um, medical officers in OPEC, I feel, but that is something you know I can, um, I can definitely ask and provide feedback on if, um, if they are able to give any. And okay. I see one more, Keith. I see Sam. Sam Howard is there, and he is the project leader for that um, for the standard that I mentioned. And um, he can, you know, if there are any questions on that, um, go ahead and shoot the questions over, and we'll get Sam involved as well. So thank you, Sam. Sam is the uh, chief executive officer of Onda Corporation, which uh, is, uh, as many of you know, manufactures hydrophones. And, and does acoustic output uh, measurements as a service. Um, some of these others are, have overlapped, I think, what you've already told us. Um, so thank you, Shuba, for those answers, um, those tough questions, because I, I have been in that position before, and I know it's always hard to, uh, to make general uh, responses for FDA regulatory policy. So it's time for a break now. Um, and we will convene at 35 minutes after the hour for the panel discussion, uh, which would include uh, the speakers that we just uh, heard, as well as uh, four other members. So thank you, and I'll, I'll see you again at uh, 35 minutes after the hour. Welcome back, everybody. We're now going to start the panel discussion, which Dr. Keith Ware and I will be uh, moderating. We have uh, three of our speakers from the first session. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Woodworth can't join us um, now, but we'll hopefully be able to join a little bit later. Um, and also I'm happy to answer any questions as a uh, co-investigator in the clinical study of blood-brain barrier opening. And we're joined by uh, four additional speakers, John Canada, who is Director of Research and Advanced Development at Histosonics, Michael Canny, who is Scientific Director at Carthera, Dinah Parker, who is uh, Director at Oxonics Therapeutics, QA Director, and Ryan Jones, Research Associate at Sunnybrook. So welcome to our enlarged panel. Um, we uh, encourage uh, you all to put uh, new questions into the uh, platform. We've, we've cleared the questions from the earlier session, although uh, we're happy to re revisit those. So if, you, if you'd like to revisit questions, please put them in. And if you have uh, your question directed to a particular panelist, please note that as well. So, um, just to start things off a little bit, we've heard a lot about um, a variety of approaches, different technologies, uh, different organ targets. Um, there's, there's a lot here. Um, and there are a, a few themes that, that we've noted um, and uh, also a few outstanding questions from the, uh, the first session. Um, so one of those, um, oh, I'm supposed to lean more to my right, sorry. Um, <laughs> One of those uh, had to do with echo focusing, um, and that was directed uh, to Tim. Um, so since that was a, a pending question, why don't we start off with that? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to talk about that uh, briefly. Um, 
Yeah, so this is a, an approach uh, to try to improve the phase corrections that are employed during the uh, brain treatments. Uh, so just a bit of background currently for those that are unaware, um, the patient will undergo a CT scan uh, sometime before the treatment. Um, and during the treatment, the CT scan is registered with the MR of the patient and numerical models are used to approximate uh, the beam propagation from each element within the transducer uh, to achieve um, focusing at the target. Uh, but we know from our lab experience, uh, work that's been done in France led by Jerome Gateau and as well as some work done here at Sunnybrook that uh, these are often imperfect corrections and that if we could measure these aberrations um, in situ, we could get better focusing and potentially better treatment outcomes. So um, this is the company's implementation of one such approach um, where we add an additional procedure where an infusion of a low concentration of bubbles is administered to the patient and low intensity pulsed exposures are applied and the emissions uh, that are coming back from these bubbles are recorded and used to detect uh, element-wise phase and amplitude aberrations that can be used during the treatment. And so we did a small study in, in 12 patients and compared using similar exposure settings uh, the original CT-based focusing to this advanced uh, echo focusing technique and saw that we were able to get on average about a 25-26% increase in the temperature at a, a fixed power. So we get uh, better focusing um, and I think where this is really exciting is, so we did that study in patients with a central tremor where a central target is, is relatively easy to heat, but uh, looking beyond that in, in sort of uh, OCD or, or depression applications where the target is less central in the brain, harder to treat using existing techniques, uh, being able to get additional temperature elevations there will be very exciting. Okay, um, so while we're waiting for the questions to, to come in, uh, I'd like to say a, a few words about uh, this question of whether contrast agents should be uh, regulated as drugs or devices, because that seemed to uh, stimulate some, some conversation last week. And uh, as Brian Folks indicated last week, uh, this started when a company called uh, Genus Medical Technologies uh, submitted an application for a barium sulfate a contrast agent for GI radiography to FDA. And uh, FDA designated the agent as a drug, okay? And that's because since 1997, FDA has regulated all contrast agents as drugs. And there's a history behind that. And uh, Alexander Klibanoff uh, hinted at it. Um, back in the 90s, there was a, an agent that was submitted uh, as a device to the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, uh, where Shuba and I work. And um, it was initially regulated and reviewed as a, as a device. But the other ultrasound um, contrast agent manufacturers found out about this and they raised concerns about the potential for uh, an inconsistent regulatory process. And they actually petitioned the FDA, which is a, a formal legal process that you can go through. They petitioned the FDA to take steps to ensure a consistency of the review process. So in response to that, and also in response to litigation that was associated with that, uh, which is Braco versus Shalala 1997, the FDA made the decision to review um, all imaging contrast agents as drugs. Okay, so this was in response to concerns uh, expressed by, by industry. So when FDA made that decision, uh, it, it, it was assuming that FDA had the discretion to regulate contrast agents as either drugs or devices, since contrast agents can be seen to be consistent with the legal definitions of either one. And, and you can see that if you look at the, defini the legal definitions of drugs and devices. Uh, for example, for both drugs and devices, the definitions say they are intended for use in diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. And they are also intended to affect the structure or any function of the body. So those are, those are things that describe contrast agents. Uh, in addition, if you look at the legal definition, for device, 
In addition to what I just said, uh, devices do not achieve their primary intended purposes through chemical action within or on the body and um, are not dependent on being metabolized in order to achieve their primary um, intended purpose. Okay, so uh, contrast agents can, are consistent with either drugs or devices. Genus wanted their agent to be regulated as a device. Uh, drugs and devices are regulated according to different laws, in some cases, different sections of the law. And so it matters to the device developer or product developer, let's say, uh, how, the device, how the product is regulated. So Genus took to FDA to court over this because FDA had originally um, designated uh, their agent as a drug. And both the district court and a federal court of appeals uh, disagreed with FDA's view that, that I stated later, that I stated previously that, uh, that FDA had actually had the discretion to regulate products meeting the device definition as drugs, okay? So going forward, FDA intends to regulate products that meet both the device and drug definition as devices, except in cases where uh, statutes indicate that Congress intended otherwise. So as Brian Folks uh, indicated uh, a week ago, uh, stakeholders have been invited to submit comments on this process. And uh, there's a comment period and the end of the comment period has been extended until November 30th. So there's still time to uh, provide input to the FDA if you're interested in doing so. And please contact Shuba or me uh, if, and we can help you uh, with that. So things are kind of up in the air still and, and the final resolution is going to depend a lot on input from stakeholders, like maybe some people in this audience and, and the contrast agent manufacturers and, and others. And uh, so things are a little bit unsettled. Um, so I wish I could be more definitive, but, but that's, that's where things stand now. And, and hopefully um, a resolution will be achieved that will, that will be acceptable to uh, the contrast agent developers and also the device developers in this audience and, and uh, American patients who receive healthcare. Are there questions related to the device versus drug question? Yeah, I would. I would just like to comment that this is um, something that's um, very topical for us at Oxonics because um, those of you who attended um, last week's session will remember a talk from my colleague um, Dr. Christian Coviello about. Um, our cavitation agent, which which we manufacture as, as um, one component of our device. Um, and this has been a really interesting ruling um, and a lot to consider really, because uh, we're considering the, obviously the US regulations, but also the EU regulations, which have now recently changed. Um, and I think the EU and the, and the FDA sometimes look to each other for um, indications on, on how things are going and uh, this sudden change in the FDA's um, uh, approach to kind of a fourth change, I guess, um, is, is making us quite um, interested in what might happen in the EU as a result of that as, as well. And um, I don't know if anyone has any, any thoughts on the kind of relative um, feelings in the industry about this change, because obviously for existing manufacturers of contrast agents who already have the products on the market regulated as a drug, um, you know, that might, um, it might not be good news for them if they then have to re-regulate as, as a device. Um, so I wondered whether the, the thought is that the FDA are going to be focusing mainly on new, um, new products with this, um, with this uh, overhaul or whether it will be retrospective as well. Well, um, FDA is going through a process now where they are re-examining whether individual agents that are already regulated by the FDA uh, 
meet the, the definition of a device. Um, and um, I don't know the specific answer to your question. It's a very pertinent question. But uh, FDA has said that it will aim to affect necessary product transitions in a way that does not disrupt the supply of contrast agents or place undue burden on manufacturers or on the healthcare delivery system. So that's about all I can say right now, but that, that's a very good question. So we, we have some questions from the audience. Um, the first one, um, I appreciated the comment from Tim that direct visualization during treatment is needed. B mode or passive cavitation mapping can do this, but they only show where there are bubbles. Is this sufficient for guidance during treatment or is a more direct assessment of the actual bio effect needed? For example, seeing gadolinium extravasing or in blood-brain barrier opening, or seeing tissue li liquefy in histotripsy. So it's uh, an interesting question. I think it's I can probably divide it into what's going to happen in the next five years versus what's going to happen in the next fifteen to twenty years, right? And so, for now, directly visualizing it is the best thing we have, right? And when you look at some of the alternatives, like if we're doing passive cavitation detection, um, if we're doing anything, we're going to be trying to map it, right? And we don't have the ability, uh, unlike uh, when we're treating maybe in the brain where structures are not moving, to be able to really map and fuse real time where that is occurring versus where it's actually occurring in the body, right? So the direct visualization is really the only effect we have right now. And as I tried to allude to in the talk, it is a huge leap forward from what we're doing with uh, uh, with needle-based ablations and being able to monitor and, you know, many people not even monitoring, right? So we have a, a giant leap forward uh, with the, the ability to even see this bubble cloud and based on preclinical work. And as long as we have strong preclinical data that we're getting the treatment effect from that. And then as we're gathering more clinical data that the where we're seeing the bubble cloud, we're actually getting the treatment effect. I think for the next, you know, five to 10 years, that's probably going to be our best thing as some of these other methods develop. Uh, ultimately, as we improve our, you know, our fusions, like I uh, had alluded to in the, the question and answer session, uh, you know, working with cone beam CT, some kind of real time fusion that we can use more reliably for, for the liver or abdominal organs that are moving, uh, then maybe we can move to, to some of these uh, for, for histotripsy specifically. Um, but for now, I think it's really hard to push past uh, directly visualizing and knowing you get that effect because we don't, we can't see the liquefaction perfectly in, in real time, right? You can, but you can see where the bubble cloud's at. And we know strongly that where that bubble cloud is at is where we have adequate treatment effect. Um, I can answer a little bit from the brain perspective. So while we don't have the same problems with organ motion, um, we have other challenges. So the detection of cavitation through the skull uh, is subject to a number of, of artifacts. Um, and also the, the correlation between the uh, cavitation events and the actual blood-brain barrier opening depends on many variables, uh, which differ from patient to patient and from location to location within, the, the, within a given patient. Um, that's made it hard to get very uh, tight correlations between cavitation monitoring and the therapeutic effect. Um, in terms of looking at something like uh, gadolinium extravasion, uh, at least at this time, um, the FDA has not wanted gadolinium to be in the bloodstream at the time of sonication. So the gadolinium is administered later. Um, and then um, the correlation between gadolinium extravasion and drug delivery is another area that deserves more investigation. Okay, there's an, uh, another regulatory question for Shuba. Uh, is cavitation monitoring a required part for application when submitting to the FDA for uh, devices 
uh, that do histotripsy or blood brain barrier opening? It is any therapeutic device, um, ultrasound device that is capable of creating cavitation, we do ask that um, cavitation detection be employed. Again, through those processes of detection, monitoring, and um, mitigation of adverse events. There's a question on Graham's talk. I wonder if, if Alex would be interested in chiming in. Uh, sure. So um, the question is, what are the sources of heterogeneity of cavitation dose, even when there is already feedback to control ac acoustic output? How much is due to variations in bubble concentration? Um, from my perspective, uh, the answer to that is we, we don't know. Um, there are a number of outstanding questions about um, the gray matter versus white matter, uh, peritumoral areas that may have abnormal blood vessels, uh, distance from the skull. Um, so one of our challenges is treating peripheral targets. Um, and um, the, the concentration of, of bubbles, uh, not per se in the bloodstream, but per cubic millimeter of tissue uh, seems to vary quite a lot. Um, we, as uh, you saw um, in Dr. Huang's uh, talk, we have uh, developed a number of, of techniques for this closed loop control, which uh, initially involved, uh, as, as he pointed out, turning off the hotspots, um, but that enabled um, those areas to get a dose delivery very quickly, which uh, we don't know what the impacts of that are. And then the, the, the cold spots, those areas that seem to not have a lot of cavitation events, um, we, we don't really know what that is. Some of that may be due to gliosis and a lack of blood vessels in that area. Um, so th the answer really is that there are, there are so many outstanding uh, questions um, that need to be investigated um, most likely in preclinical models so that we can get um, correlation of actual blood-brain barrier opening, delivery of uh, drugs of different sizes, um, for example, using uh, radio-labeled drugs, um, and also the reversibility of any um, adverse findings such as petechiae. Um, maybe I can add a few words. Uh, I agree that the inhomogeneity is caused by the probably vascular density. Um, so different targets have different dose. But uh, the technically the reason we use the feedback controller, we still have an inhomogeneous dose distribution. Was because for this controller, the current uh, version, uh, it, they didn't control the power of each subspot individually. They control the average of the whole grade. So probably to smooth out the, the power variation a little bit. So if you control each subspot, uh, we found that the magnitude of cavitation of each sub subspot can have a difference of like a order of magnitude. So the power will be dropped up and down very frequently. Um, but that, as far as I know, the company already tested a new version of uh, the controller that will control the power of each subspot. So uh, we haven't received it yet, but we, we are looking forward to test it. Uh, uh, very soon. So that will greatly improve the homogeneity of, of the target and also in a timely ma manner that uh, every subspot will be syndicated uh, roughly equal duration. Um, there's a question for you, Dr. Wang, um, that I'll, I'll just ask now since you're on the line. Um, the question is about the microbubble dose used in Toronto for blood brain barrier opening and whether that is under or over the diagnostic microbubbles. Right. So, in the first uh, two or three years, uh, we were uh, using the diagnostic dose limit of 20 microliter per kilogram. Uh, that's uh, according to that. Then, we recently, in the last couple of years, we got approval for a higher dose. So it's uh, 150 microliter per kilogram. That's about 7.5 times higher. And practically, I think with our concentration of like a four microliter per kilogram per five minutes, uh, that's enough for three hours. That's 
uh, infusion. So that's practically probably high enough. Uh, we believe even higher microbubble dose uh, shouldn't cause much problem for most patients as long as there's no like a cardiac shunt or that, shunt, that type of patient, which will be excluded from the trial anyway. But for the regular patient, they should be okay. But 150 for us right now is, uh, is high enough and we haven't experienced any side effect for, from the patient we treated. Uh, in the future, uh, for sure, uh, there's the interest whether like for tumor treatment was an optimal concentration in vivo we should use to maximize the efficiency. So maybe a higher concentration is needed. In that case, if we still need to treat for a couple hours, we still probably still need to increase the total dose limit in the future. Uh, that's something unknown yet, but, uh, but for now, uh, it's about 7.5 7 times higher than the diagnostic. But in most patients, uh, if not the tumor patient, the for smaller target, uh, we normally buy below the current limit. It's like a 50, 60 uh, microliter uh, rather than 150. Um, we have a, another question for you, Dr. Huang. Uh, your talk would suggest that any striation of bubble size within the IV bag does not seem to have an effect. The agents are clearly not monodisperse, so perhaps bubble concentration and bubble size may not be all that important or all that critical. For example, enough is enough for bubbles to reliably seed cavitation. What are your thoughts? Well, I think there will be some variabilities of microbubbles, especially if you keep it uh, uh, like stay without mixing for over extended time. Uh, but uh, in, in general, the, the larger microbubbles, uh, we can use a lower power to, to have a effect that will cause a little bit of variabilities in terms of BB opening or the T2 star like bleeding effect. But uh, well, first of all, I add a little bit uh, in, in the infusion question. We didn't have a pump to do the infusion, but we do have a drip counter to monitor the drip rate. So that uh, can be very precise on how many drips per minute. So that will greatly help us to, to start with uh, based on the patient body weight, based on the roughly time duration we want to treat, uh, or what precisely the drip rate we will use. Uh, but in terms of the, if the bubble uh, in the back, they are combined making larger bubbles, uh, I assume they will drift up, uh, upward rather than like a going into the line downward uh, fast. So I think there's an automatic filter in that sense. Uh, that's probably smaller bubbles will go in first. And in most cases, we didn't really use the full back for the micro bubble anyway. So uh, probably that helps a little bit. But Yes, I, I totally agree that uh, it will be interesting to monitor at least not not on patient, probably on animal or, or some other even bench top. Well, we can monitor the the over time what the size of the bubble and the concentration of the bubble. Maybe using optical observer or something uh, over the drip. Uh, that would be very interesting to know. Um, another question has to do with MRI monitoring of cavitation activity. Could one of the panelists comment on this approach? I'm happy to start commenting on it. On it. So uh, for MR monitoring cavitation activity, I think it'll it can be a great potential solution. There are some difficulties that, that come into play for it. Um, one of them being the actual space in an MR machine of being able to fit all the equipment inside. Uh, so you know, the various vendors will have to ensure that equipment can be fit inside. And again, this I'm coming at it from my uh, treating in the abdomen bend versus treating uh, in the head where I think it's much more common. Um, being able to fit all the equipment into an MR machine is very difficult. And then. Once you look at beyond the, the thinnest patients, we have trouble fitting some patients uh, in the MR machine just by themselves. Um, and so uh, for the abdomen, I think there's some hurdles and there's there are wider bore scanners and you know potentially open scanners for, for doing those things, but even those have some uh, size limitations. And so there's, I think a lot of technical development that needs to be done to, to get that working for, for the abdomen and, and pelvis. 
Um, another question I think, uh, Tim, maybe you can answer. Um, what has been done in the field with coupling materials to prevent prefocal cavitation outside of the body? What sort of standoff materials have been used successfully? You discussed um, degassed water. Any other ideas? Yeah, so the my experience has been entirely with degassed water, but I'll, uh, I know there are, you know, there's work on additional coupling materials and actually I'll probably defer to John Kanata on that because he's been working on various coupling materials I know. Yeah, so thanks, Tim. Um, Definitely the gas water is something that we've used successfully and there are different membrane materials um, that you can use and we've used to contain the water. Um, and, uh, and so we really haven't had trouble with uh, prefocal cavitation. I know there's cavitation reducing liquids out there. Um, I'm not sure if they uh, would be, they would probably most likely be required to be um, uh, contained uh, because I don't think they can be used in skin con contact. Um, but um, I know oils and other things have been used in the past to uh, reduce prefocal cavitation too. Okay, there's a question for Shuba Marivada. Uh, it seems an interesting opportunity to use IEC Technical Standard 63001. Uh, as a starting point, could you give some high-level descriptions of the methods described in this standard for cavitation control applied sure. in equipment cleaning? Thanks, Keith. Um, I'd also invite the person, you know, whoever is interested to let me know um, who you are, because I would like to also put you in touch with Sam Howard. But just an overview of um, 63001, it gets into the measurement equipment. So um, calibration of hydrophone sensitivity, what kind of meters um, might be used, um, cal you know, characterization of the meters, requirements for equipment being characterized in terms of temperature and chemistry compatibility with the hydrophone. Um, electrical infer uh, interference, as well as measurement procedures using um, reference measurements, in situ um, monitoring measurements. Um, so that's a high level overview. But again, I um, I think there are definitely places that we you know we can definitely use this um, standard as a starting point, along with some of the other ideas that people had presented. Um, the standard already has definitions in place for. Um, a lot of the terms around cavitation and some of the equipment um, for cavitation monitoring. Um, and there is interest from, from several uh, working group conveners in IEC that this is really important. And I, I forgot to mention working group nine. Um, so working group nine, at, Keith is um, a member, they're very interested in also having some kind of cavitation um, detection standard moving forward. So. Um, I'd like to continue this conversation and have you know Sam Howard involved and again anyone else who would be interested. Yeah, uh, well, well, thank you, Shuba, for that complete answer. And 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 while we're on the subject of IEC standards, uh, there, there's a there's another one that, that's that's related. It's uh, IEC sixty two three fifty nine. And although that's a diagnostic standard, uh, that's for measurement of the output display indexes, the mechanical index and the thermal index. There's that's being going through its its revision cycle as as all IEC standards do, and there's an effort to um, allow for increased acoustic output in uh, diagnostic ultrasound. Okay, increased mechanical index, for example. And this is prompted by the work by Kathy Nightingale at all at Duke. She does um, ARFI, acoustic radiation force impulse, uh, shear wave elastography. And she has shown uh, in some papers that, uh, that some liver patients um, are, are pretty big and there, there are depth of penetration issues. And she has shown that if, if you can use increased acoustic output beyond the um, recommended FDA maximum levels, you can get deeper penetration and you can get higher quality uh, diagnostic measurements of, of shear wave velocity. So, 
And shear wave velocity is, has been shown to be very useful for uh, uh, detecting fibrosis, for example, when the liver gets stiffer. And so Kathy and others uh, wrote a paper, appeared in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine in 2015, looking into the safety aspects of this. And um, they did a literature survey uh, and, and took a lot of data points of cavitation thresholds measured in animal experiments. And, and I know um, Eli Velasovich and, and Adam Maxwell gave good presentations on cavitation thresholds and in histotripsy uh, for both single cycle and, and multi-cycle pulses. I think uh, Kathy's paper might contribute to that literature as we're all you know, looking for um, a, a good index to tell us uh, cavitation threshold in, in vivo because that diagnostic value of mechanical index 1.9 that, that we're all familiar with, um, as some of you may know, that's not based at all on safety analysis. That's based on substantial equivalence. Uh, there was an important law in 1976 um, where, where the legal concept of substantial equivalence was introduced for the regulation of uh, medical devices. And it said that um, new devices coming along after enactment of that law in 1976, they could be cleared by the FDA if they could be shown to be substantially equivalent in terms of safety and effectiveness to devices that were already on the market prior to enactment of the 1976 medical device amendments. So um, some people who were around at the time, Jerry Harris, who's a good friend of Shuba's and mine, uh, our colleague at the FDA, Paul Carson from the University of Michigan and others, they went around and they measured diagnostic output, um, acoustic output of all, all the systems they could find that had been on the market prior to the date of enactment of the medical device amendments. And that value of 1.9, that that's the maximum mechanical index that was produced by any all the devices they could find. Okay, so it's all about substantial equivalence. Um, and, you know, as we, so it, it's not about safety and, and based on, um, the analysis in, in that paper by Nightingale et al., they argue that uh, what they call the effective mechanical index, you can go uh, up to a value of four, okay, roughly twice the, the diagnostic value and still uh, uh, be reasonably assured of no cavitation. So I think, um, yeah, I think that effort, um, Although it's from the diagnostic realm, I think it's very relevant to the things we're talking about here. Keith, I'd like to say one more thing. I just want to do, give a shout out to John Kanata, who's also in IEC and involved in working group six. And I think, um, yeah, we could, again, just kind of starting to pull names together, people together. So John, <laughs> just putting you on notice. <laughs> Um, we, there's a question for Dr. Kanata. Um, beyond B mode imaging, is there any additional cavitation monitoring used for histotripsy in your system? Uh, no, um, at this time there isn't. Both the BPH system and our liver systems are reliant on B mode. Um, so you need to be able to see the uh, bubble cloud and, and also see the tissue in order to plan and target and, and treat. Um, you can also hear it. So some of us that uh, are really um, have our ears tuned can can tell when it's there, um, but we need to be able to visualize it with B mode. Uh, I had a follow up question there. Um, is it pretty easy to see the lesions in all patients, or is it problematic uh, in some patients? And I guess this is for. Uh, yeah, some of our clinical contributors as well. Yeah, so the lesions are 
almost always easy to see with the just like a standard transabdominal ultrasound, which we do ahead of time and kind of use that in the planning. Uh, when we have a water bath in place, it become more difficult to see, but usually we can still see them well. Um, and especially in this, you know, we use pretty regularly for placing needles for biopsies and things if we're not seeing perfectly used landmarks. Um, and so right now, I, I think we see things well enough. There is definitely room for improvement. Um, and we've already taken this step when we're placing needles where we'll fuse with CT and MR, which I think is a, a future realm that uh, will be undertaken for this as well. We're fusing with CT and MR, fusing ultrasound with ultrasound. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of improvement that can be done in that area. For right now, it, it works, uh, but it can definitely be improved is probably the best answer I can give. Is there a dependence of detectability on depth of the lesion or, or shallower lesions uh, easier to monitor than deeper lesions? Uh, so it actually, it's a little uh, interesting because a lot of it depends on artifact that you get off the abdominal wall with the water bath as a step off. Uh, so sometimes deep lesions are actually easier to see because your diagnostic transducer is closer to the skin surface than superficial lesions. Um, and so it's it's been relatively case by case on, on how well you can see it. But the, the thing I will say is to, to date, we've been able to see it with enough confidence that uh, we're sure we're treating in an appropriate location. Uh, here's a question to uh, Mike Canny. Uh, does Carthera monitor and regulate cavitation during treatment? Otherwise, how is treatment efficacy assessed? And are and is there a need for are there needs for new metrics and methods? Sure, thank you. Um, we actually don't. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of our device, we actually use an implantable ultrasound device. Um, it's called the SonoCloud device. And right now we have a device called the SonoCloud 9 and it actually replaces the bone flaps. So there's no propagation through the bone. Uh, the ultrasound propagation is only in tissue, basically through the dura mater and then into the brain for blood brain barrier disruption. Uh, the unique thing about our device is actually that every device is calibrated uh, ahead of time. So we know exactly the acoustic output of the device. Uh, when we activate it, and we activate it right now, uh, we're sending about one megapascal at one megahertz on uh, the acoustic pulses that we're sending. And we don't have any feedback right now on the device. Um, what we've seen, I can tell you, is we've treated over, I think, 80 patients right now, several hundred sonications to do blood-brain barrier disruption using kind of a standard uh, imaging level of contrast agent with Definity. We're using 10 microliters per kilo. Uh, just doing a 30-second bolus injection at the beginning of the sonication, uh, which lasts about four minutes. Uh, and we've seen pretty excellent BBB disruption in, in most of our patients um, and haven't had any safety effects. The T2 star spots that I think Inside Tech has observed in some patients, to my knowledge, at least, we haven't seen those in patients. Um, so that, that's, that's about all I can say about our approach right now. Okay, um, there's another question, uh, pulling back one of the prior questions for John and Tim. The bubble cloud visualization comment is interesting. In, in a prior study for histotripsy to treat BPH and prostate, a bubble cloud was detected, but there was little improvement in treatment outcomes. Any comment on that observation relative to your experience? I think that. I think this question is all me. Um, <clears throat> so I think um, one thing to start with is just talking about the general differences between the system that we used for BPH and our system now. Um, BPH, um, uh, the system was a, a manual treatment system. So the user would guide the bubble cloud through the volume. Um, and we had great imaging. Um, we had a transrectal imaging probe um, for that guidance. The therapy transducer was transperineal and, and, um, and the imaging probe was transrectal. So we had good visualization, but we relied on the user um, to uh, 
to determine how how long they would dwell in certain locations. Um, it's it's pretty inefficient to do things that way. Um, and what we do now is is on our dose and our coverage is is um, well, the user decides the, the, the size of the coverage, um, but uh, our dose is determined on the system level based on our, our, all of our preclinical work. And, um, and so uh, we're not as much relying on the user to decide um, when a section of the, the tissue is treated. And I think that had a big part of why we didn't see or detect using transrectal ultrasound um, uh, uh, a significant reduction in uh, a detectable reduction in the size of the prostate. And as, as Tim mentioned, we did have symptom relief. So there was, there was definitely some level de of debulking, but it was not enough to, um, to be measurable or to improve flow. Okay. Uh, another one for Mike Canning. Uh, given the limited acoustic aperture for your system, how is the spatial control uh, in comparison to other approaches? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, right now, we're treating patients with GBM, uh, which is really an infiltrative disease, and our device is placed after actually um, resection. So surgeon goes in and tries to resect as much of the tumor as they can. And then they basically place the device at the end of the surgery to cover kind of as much of the suspected infiltrated region as possible. Um, so our device right now is fixed. It, it just has nine uh, circular one megahertz emitters that are each 10 millimeters in diameter. And really we're just trying to sonicate as much of that infiltrative uh, region as we can to get drug there. Um, and so that, that's our approach right now. Um, another question for you, Michael. What is the rate of infusion of the DFINITY? I'm getting all the questions all of a sudden. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so for the DFINITY, we're actually just giving it kind of as a bolus. Uh, we, we injected over 30 seconds followed by a saline flush. Um, and, and that's pretty consistent. Like I said, 10 microliters per kilo. We're using kind of that standard imaging dose of Definity and just, just injecting it over a 30 second bolus at the beginning of the start of the sonication. So your sonication doesn't last very long. Our whole sonication is four and a half minutes. So we don't need any MRR system. Uh, we, we, we do monitor blood brain barrier opening at least at the first cycle in, in patients now in our studies. But after that, we actually don't use any MRR. Um, and we have clinical sites that are lining up patients in infusion suites and basically sonicating one after the other. You know, you can do three or four in a morning easily with, with just a few people. Um, so kind of the, the clinical burden is, is, is quite a bit lower than I think using the inside tech system. So uh, I'm interested in hearing from the uh, folks uh, at the FDA, their thoughts about um, the, uh, the delivery of ultrasound without the feedback on cavitation or via imaging. Um, I, I, it's done again on a case by case basis. So it's really a question if, if the ultrasound device um, can produce cavitation, then what is going to be done about it? If, if they show that cavitation does, is not generated and is not a problem, then that's, that's fine, right? Then we don't, that's accepted. But if it is generated, then the safety and efficacy questions do come up. And we do work with the sponsor again on a case by case basis. You know, it's very application dependent um, and it's device dependent. And so that is taken into account. Uh, this yeah. actually, uh, Keith had asked a question in our preparation for this about the use of the term cavitation 
and whether that was a, a pejorative term and what other terms might be used. I mean, I've seen bubble activity, bubble formation, you know, using bubbles in some way instead of cavitation. Um, I think I think that's decreasing that pejorative view of you know the term cavitation because maybe of histotripsy and and even lithotripsy where it is understood that cavitation is is being needed you know it's um, and just needs to be directed properly. Um, so I feel like maybe that's getting a little better, but then I, I do agree there there can be you know we tend to have. Yeah, kind of a worrisome, right? Attitude about cavitation as opposed to, and, and that's primarily because, right? It's, it's a stochastic process. It can be a random process. And uh, we just want to, just want to be able to understand it in terms of the treatment. Well, there's a question to Dr. Golby and canny for blood brain barrier opening is MRI such as T2 star a proven and efficient way to assess treatment efficacy or are novel methods needed? Um, so we actually um, use uh, gadolinium enhancement to measure treatment e efficacy. And we use the T2 star to monitor for um, adverse events specifically uh, petechial or other hemorrhage. And yeah, I would just agree with that response. I'd say we also look at flare to see if there's any kind of inflammatory processes that happened after blood brain barrier disruption, but those are the main things that we do as well. We can add a few words on that. We, we found that uh, using gadolinium to, to verify the efficacy, um, it works fine for the normal brain tissues for the like Parkinson's Alzheimer's. In, in those cases, the enhancement was quite obvious because there's no background uh, guard enhancement. But for tumors, sometimes it's difficult, uh, it's, especially if you consider the, the significant time delay between the injection of, of the gadolinium, which has a very short half-life, like 30 minutes, uh, versus a very long uh, treatment. Uh, so we uh, also try to use uh, radio-labeled drugs, uh, which has a very long half-life in, in vivo, like 72 hours, uh, 70, 70 hours in vivo, and, and look at the like 48-hour accumulation of the drug. Uh, I feel that probably works better than gadolinium and, and more practical, more accurate. Uh, the gadolinium I think one is subject to the, the the delay variations, and second, I think we still don't quite understand why in the tumor uh, inflammatory uh, TCO is more difficult to see it in most cases, and maybe the interstitial uh, pressure was higher, so it's it's more difficult for the gut to leak in, or because just the half life of gut is too short. Um, I also see uh, Dr. Woodworth just came in, maybe he can also comment. Uh, their experience on the GBM trial. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I missed the question, but it sounds like you're talking about ways to gauge the effect of blood-brain barrier disruption following treatments. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. No, I, I agree with with Dr. Golby's you know statement that we sort of look to balance the the efficacy with you know potential side effects. Looking at the contrast enhanced images uh, juxtaposed the GRE, T2 star, uh, SWI uh, sequences, but it, uh, more and more we're looking at the acoustic emissions signature um, that we're seeing from the bubble activity throughout the treatment as a gauge for a desired effect. So I would say it's as much the, the MRI findings as the intra-treatment acoustic emissions patterns that we see during the treatment. Uh, we haven't heard so much from Dr. Parker yet, but here's a question for her. Uh, do you think it will be easier to obtain regulatory approval for inert agents such as the nanocups rather than micro bubbles? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure really on that. Um, micro bubbles have more of a history. 
uh, more of a regulatory approval history. So they're, they're kind of a known, they're a known concept. Um, but there are also known limitations for them, I would say. Um, so, um, I mean, so far for us, we we haven't yet hit any significant barriers with our um, with our uh, cup and bubble based cavitation agent. Um, we're still a long road ahead. Um, so, yeah, difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, I, th I think probably about even really uh, for for both approaches. Okay, um, thank you. Um, another question to um, Dr. Mari Vada. Are there any movements toward doing cavitation monitoring in lithotripsy? Cavitation is monitored during lithotripsy procedures um, from the start because it's known and, and for two reasons. Well, the main reason is to make sure that there is no prefocal um, bubble cloud formation that would impede um, getting energy to that stone. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's in terms of safety, uh, we ask for that for that mitigation. So that's been a part of lithotripsy devices almost since the inception. Well, another regulatory question. Uh, we have heard that, quote, nano, unquote, has been a concern in potential submissions to the FDA. Do you have any thoughts on that? Keith, I, I, I defer to you on that. Um, I haven't heard um, any concerns. I mean, I, I know that um, Megan's talk was really interesting when she covered how, you know, nano isn't really nano. Um, so I, that might also be a, a, the term being, you know, like cavitation, like there are already some kind of, you know, just uh, preformative beliefs around the term that might affect. Um, yeah, right. Um, and, and Eleanor Stride emphasized that the, the prefix nano is, is a bit overused and a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it does remind people of, nanoparticles, which are used in optics to, uh, in, in therapy, to increase the optical absorption of, of the targeted tissue. And there you have obvious bio effects. Um, and that might be what some people are thinking when uh, you use the prefix nano. And it, it, of course, does bring up concerns of uh, safety. Yeah. Yeah, I think I would I would agree with that. And as was mentioned in the previous session, um, if you're following the ISO 10993 standards, then um, and and some of the European regulations, then for nano you need to have at least fifty percent of, of your product under 100 nanometers in diameter. Um, and I think most cavitation agents were well above that. Um, so really, it's it's about the usual. When you're thinking about the biocompatibility, it's about the usual risk-based approach. You know, what are the actual risks that you are you are looking at here? And I think the um, risks that are intended to be addressed by some of the standards and regulations and guidance looking at nanomaterials are not really relevant. Um, but obviously, a number of other factors are. Uh, we have a, a question uh, for Dr. Jones, but could be directed to, towards several members of the panel. Um, what do you think is the most practical thing we can do in the next five years to create feedback maps that are quantitative and consistent across clinical locations and maybe even different systems? Also, what are your thoughts on the need to have calibrated maps as discussed in some of the earlier sessions? Uh, so thanks for the question. Hopefully my video works this time. Um, maybe it looks like it hasn't. Anyways, I'll continue on audio. Yes, this is a very uh, interesting and, and difficult question. Um, 
I do certainly think calibration is important, and I, I know we've we've touched on this um, in various sessions throughout this workshop. Um, uh, but I but I do think, uh, and you know, you know, there are there are ways of of calibrating uh, equipment, and some great ideas have come out of this workshop to do so. Uh, but I do think there some work does remain to be done on on quote unquote out, uncalibrated systems. So particularly relating the uh, acoustic emissions that we're getting to the associated bioeffects. And so this, lead, this sort of links back to what Dr. Woodworth was talking about and also my colleague, Yushi Huang. So uh, not in the context of BBB opening, but maybe at higher bubble levels and higher exposure conditions, we recently published uh, sort of preclinical data showing that we can use our um, three-dimensional passive cavitation imaging to predict the spatial uh, extent of the T2 star weighted uh, hypo intensities that are seen after treatment. So um, studies such as that um, for different bioeffects that we would expect to see uh, looking at those correlations, I think that can be done with without necessarily calibrated systems. Um, and so certain um, aspects come up there. So such as we're getting microbubble emissions over the whole uh, treatment duration from pulse to pulse. And I guess an open question there would be, how do we take that data and combine it into a so-called like, aggregate image that we then compare to the bio effect? I think that's, uh, there have, different, have been different approaches that have been uh, taken to date, and, and uh, certainly we haven't found the optimal one, and that might be different for different bio effects, whether it's looking to predict the uh, extravasation of, of GAD or, or looking to map any, any tissue damage. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a loaded question. I guess that's my, my two cents on it. Um, and I guess also, uh, just before I finish, uh, yeah, the question earlier about uh, poor correlation between the emissions that are currently uh, being overlaid during the uh, treatments with the Incitec system um, to the resulting bioeffects. So using spatial information from, from imaging might, might provide better, um, so cavitation imaging might, might help improve those correlations. So. Um, I'm sure that's something that, that the company will look to implement in, in future work. Uh, here's a question that can be broadly addressed to many of the panelists. Uh, have you developed specific quality assurance procedures for therapeutic equipment relying on cavitation? And I might open that up and and say relying on, on anything. Uh, I, I can I can answer for um oh sorry um short answer yes <laughs> um uh, yeah it's there are various um there are various procedures um from um you know, quality assurance testing on individual probes and and form um, <clears throat> pre-treatment. Um, I think the general point here, though, is, is that um, we developed something that's made sense for our technology, but as is the theme with a lot of um, discussions that have been going on today and in these series, um, we very much had to had to make it up based on what seemed to make sense and using little bits of little bits of things that seem relevant from other standards and guidance documents relating to ultrasound technology used in many different ways. So um, I think I think this is one area where um, it would just be so helpful if if there could be some harmonization of um, of, of of general approaches to to this kind of thing. So for example um, in in Haifu, um, in in some in some bits of equipment, there's there's a little a test that you, you do before you use the equipment, where you um, use a, a color changing crystal to see whether the ultrasound is, is being produced. So we, we we tried to do something which is kind of uses the same principles as that. Um, but um, any any other ideas and and thoughts on on this would be would be really interesting to hear. Maybe I can say a few words for the inside tech system. Uh, there are two different levels since one is the quality assurance, the other is the calibration. Uh, the quality assurance, QA, we normally refer to that before each treatment, before like in the early in the morning, we want to make sure the system works mostly normal. 
so for the high flow, we saw like the like gel phaeton to make sure the temperature more or less consistent. Um, but for PPP right now, I don't think there's a quantitative quantitative uh, measurement to ensure the cavitation uh, like a repeat every time consistent. But they do have a, a calibration. Uh, which is less frequently done, probably every few months. They have uh, uh, used their own phantom, probably let them to disclose if they want to, to, uh, to make sure the received capacity signal is consistent. And even they will measure the baseline noise uh, from the system, uh, is, which is power dependent. And that uh, cavitation level, uh, baseline noise level, will be subtracted automatically from the from the uh, real time measured cavitation. So that's uh, relies on the calibration to do it. Uh, so there's some level of calibration uh, has been implemented in the inside system, but uh, uh, probably. Uh, but if you want to discuss the certain calibration across the system, so we can compare different results of different system. I think that probably will be more difficult. Uh, probably that's something in the future. I think we've uh, asked most of the questions from the audience if not all. Uh, while we're waiting uh, for more questions, uh, there, there's uh, an FDA program that I thought might be worth mentioning to this audience. Uh, it's called Breakthrough Devices. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, some, some devices that are submitted to the FDA can be uh, designated as so-called breakthrough devices. That means uh, they they um, treat or diagnose uh, life-threatening conditions or irreversibly debilitating conditions. Um, and and this has advantages for the device developer um, because it can lead to more frequent uh, interaction with the FDA than than what happens in the traditional review process and will likely lead to faster and more effective reviews. And I think uh, these conditions, life-threatening or irreversibly debilitating conditions, um, these are relevant to a lot of the, the uh, devices that we've seen in this series of, of webinars. And in order to initiate that process, the device developer uh, must submit a request to the FDA for a so-called breakthrough device designation. Okay, and that's, that has a particular format and, and it requires the device developer to answer a number of questions, like what I just said, does it treat or diagnose a, a life-threatening condition or an irreversibly debilitating condition? Anyway, uh, it can be to um, the device developer's advantage to take, that, take advantage of that breakthrough device program. So if anybody is interested in that, please uh, contact Shuba or me and, and we can tell you uh, how to proceed there. Um, so a question popped up in, in the chat. Uh, Dr. Huang, could you give an estimate of how long the patient has to be in the Insitec system for blood brain barrier opening? Right, that depends on the applications. Like for like for the Parkinson, for example, we only target uh, uh, unilaterally one side of the putamen that uh, takes relatively fast, less than an hour. Uh, well, the treatment itself is uh, less than an hour. Um, but before that, we need to do uh, imaging and uh, MR imaging and uh, planning. So that in total, probably two hours. But uh, for the very large tumors, that uh, really depends on the volume we need to treat. The large tumors, the longest we treated is uh, the treatment itself is like three hours, and then plus the uh, imaging part, and the cytal part is like five hours. So that's that's very uh, 
exhausting experience for the patients. But uh, but I think in the future, uh, if we can improve the technical side, if we can have a uh, like subspot control of the dose, we can uh, suddenly get a larger grade. We can significantly shorten the treatment time. We basically can steer a much larger volume uh, per uh, per sonication. But that that would be improved in the future. And I would just echo that the time it has taken to treat these larger volumes is going down quickly with, as the system improves and the capabilities of the targeting broader areas and larger uh, target arrays. Um, so uh, over the course of the last two or three years, we've seen a significant decrease in the total time it takes to treat up to a 60 cc total volume around conformally around a, a tumor. So um, we are um, just over 15 minutes away from the end of the webinar, and um, we'd like to ask uh, the panelists for their um, closing comments. Um, and I guess in order of your appearance on the grid, um, we'll start with Graham. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. Um, sorry I wasn't able to join you all for the entire time, but this is certainly an exciting topic and very relevant to the clinical application of this technology for sure. You know, as, as, as I've seen it evolve, I think the development of these closed loop controllers based on some form of bubble activity monitoring with power cycling is a tremendous advance in the field of, of therapeutic ultrasound. And I think it's going to be the game changer with regard to understanding how to utilize this technology for therapeutic purposes. And I think that is where the gap is. The gap is understanding where a given degree of bubble activity or power or whatever mix of inputs and outputs we want to bring into the calculus of a given acoustic effect how that translates into a given biological effect. It's even in the radiation field, we know the given dose of radiation is going to get, create a certain amount of DNA damage. And that enables us to dose and change how we treat patients with radiation. And as many of you know, at least in the brain, those, uh, you know, the early developers of focused ultrasound for brain indications were, were very excited about this technology back in the 1950s. 60s, but then translated it into actually radiation therapy because of their ability to understand the effect of targeting radiation. It was very hard to understand and control the effect of targeting ultrasound. But we're finally here now, 70 years later, and I still think we need to, the, the big gap is, is, is what I said, I think understanding the biological effects so that we can prescribe a given dose of energy for desired and limit undesired biological effects. Oh, thanks very much, Graham. Uh, next, at least on my grid, is Tim. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, so I think I'm going to echo a lot of what Graham said there. I, mean, I think we're we've made big advances to to this point, and uh, we're making huge leaps from what we're able to do with needle-based therapy to being completely non-invasive and being able to continuously visualize with the the B mode ultrasound. But I do think it's the perfect time to really start setting the ground uh, as the purpose of this workshop is to monitor cavitation to be able to very similar to how it's done in radiation therapy where they can you know modulate the, the level of dose that's delivered as you get closer to critical structures uh, hopefully within the next five to ten years we'll be at the point where we can essentially take a ct or an mr image combine it with our uh, with our treatment modality and just draw a map on if we want to treat in the spot, we maybe want a little lower dose right next to this bile duct if I'm talking about the liver or ureter if I'm talking about the kidney um, and have the, the system deliver just that with monitoring to make sure that you're getting the actual bio effect uh, that you're aiming for. And I do think we're on the on the precipice of being able to, to get there with uh, some of the foundation that's being laid by uh, many of the excellent panelists throughout this workshop uh, and the, through the purposes of this workshop. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Muravada. Thanks. Um, so I think I think what has been shown by all the speakers. Um, during this workshop is how much work has already been done, especially in terms of understanding how to detect cavitation, 
um, how to monitor cavitation. And so I think we should use the momentum to really develop the standard. Um, and I am, I, you know, I'm not fixed on where it needs to be done. I just think that it should be done. Whatever I can do to help that get started and um, get moving, I will. I will do. I. There are a lot of working group conveners who will, are have expressed interest just from this workshop independently of my call. And so, you know, Peter Edmonds in working group nine, he's he's expressed a lot of interest. Um, several others as well. So, at least from the IEC side, there is a lot of interest in getting the standardization started. And I think again, the work has been done. Um, so at least to get this fundamental standard going in terms of just the basic equipment and methods, I think is not going to be a very big feat. It's just going to require this, keeping this momentum going. Um, and like I said, whatever I can do to help. So thanks. Um, Dr. Kanata. Uh, I think you're muted. I'm that person on this call. Um, uh, thanks for including me in this panel. Um, I thought the talks were really interesting and as well as the discussion. Um, I've had a rich and diverse experience helping de develop histotripsy for clinical applications in the last 10 years. And we've learned a lot in this process. Um, and I think that the next 10 years are gonna be amazing. Um, uh, for all of these technologies, um, we're just at the point of realizing the potential um, for uh, some of these technologies. And I think I think the answers are out there. It's just we need to keep pushing as hard as fast as we can. Uh, Dr. Juan. Uh, yes, um, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to attend this uh, workshop. Um, normally, we only like technical person, we only go to the technical uh, meetings, but this is a very rare opportunity, especially this session, like the FDA uh, clinicians and, and people from other companies uh, can stay together to discuss something. Um, I think to some sense, we, we, we are competitors in, in general, but like we try to publish paper earlier than others. But I think at this point, uh, this industry has not been established like uh, for either BBB or whatever computation applications. We, we still don't have very approved applications. So at this point, I think we need to uh, collaborate more and share more information with each other. And I think this kind of workshop is very helpful in that regard. I really appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Kenny. Sure, I just want to thank everyone for the organizers and moderators and everyone for asking me to, to be part of this panel. Uh, I think we saw a lot of great talks. I participated last week and this week, and uh, I think, you know, this, this field in general is, is finally maybe moving into the clinic after decades maybe of going to uh, acoustics conferences and seeing different talks and, and the possibilities about a lot of this we're finally in the clinic. We treated the first patient in 2014. And I think now as we and Inside Tech, and I think, you know, all these groups really gain confidence in the safety. Uh, I think we're turning a, a big corner now, you know, having treated maybe hundreds of patients now uh, combined. Um, now the next question is where Unfortunately, I think we lost Dr. Kenny. Um, Dr. Parker. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to participate. Um, today has been really interesting, as have the previous week's talks. And I think it's um, really highlighted the huge diversity that we have here, um, both in terms of the type of technology, the way it's applied, um, the different clinical indications. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, that um, is quite daunting, um, um, especially, you know, given a lot of the challenges in, in, in how you can apply things like monitoring and uh, calibration in all these different areas. 
But um, like like Mike just commented, I think what is so encouraging is seeing these technologies in the clinic now, um, especially given the really low incidence that there seems to be of adverse events. I think that's very encouraging um, for the field as a whole. Um, and also very encouraging. It's, it's great to hear from, from the FDA, especially Shiva, and her optimism <laughs> for um, coming, coming to some convergence. Um, and, and just to hear that, that there, there might be a standard even at the early stages of, of thought and development um, is, is really great. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's fantastic to hear that things are moving in the right direction and, and coming together. Um, over such a broad range of, of ideas and technologies and and ways in which um, can help patients. Uh, and finally, Dr. Jones. Yeah, thanks again for the organizing committee and, and the moderators for, for including me today. Uh, like Huang said, uh, it's, it's a rare occurrence that such a diverse group uh, gets together, and I think it's very important to do so, and, and it's been very productive. Um, and also, just to quickly echo what Dr. Woodworth was saying, yeah, I think we've um, come a long way in terms of uh, the Acoustic Commission's monitoring and control that's being implemented in some of these systems, um, but I also think there's some some work to be done, so I'm, I'm personally excited to see how that plays out in, in the future. I think... That's all our panelists, unless I accidentally skip somebody. Raise your hands if I did. Dr. Ware? Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to uh, thank all the speakers and the panelists. It was a wonderful session and echo the, the sentiment that you know rarely do you get uh, physicians and, and basic scientists and engineers all uh, in the same conversation like this. So I, I thank again the AIUM and the Focus Ultrasound Foundation uh, for organizing this, this series. And uh, thanks again for inviting me to moderate. And I guess uh, we should turn it over to Frederick Padilla and Brian Folks. Well, thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Keith and, and Alex, for moderating this, uh, this very exciting session. Thank you to all the, um, the panelists and, and speakers. Um, the recording of this session will be available uh, early next week, so you can, you can revisit it. This was our uh, fifth session and the last one uh, in the form of uh, um, panel discussion and presentations. Uh, next week will be our last uh, session of this series, and it will be an open uh, open Zoom uh, uh, meeting. It will be a working session uh, during which we want to uh, revisit some of the key uh, uh, points, key questions that have been addressed uh, um, during this uh, this workshop series uh, about calibration, standardization, uh, how, how how to report, uh, what should we measure, the, uh, the metrics for, for um, uh, cavitation, the definition of those, uh, and so on. And the idea is to, to start working toward uh, uh, a white paper and, uh, and to discuss also together as a community what, what will be our next steps in terms of uh, working groups, uh, data, repository, and so on. So I um, uh, think it's, it's really uh, the right time, as we, we have discussed, to uh, maybe uh, build on the, uh, the current momentum to, um, to start working on, on standardization and on standards. So uh, we really uh, um, would appreciate your participation and really invite you to, uh, to, to, uh, to engage uh, during next week's uh, discussions. Brian, do you want to say a, a few words? I just want to thank um, all the participants today. I want to particularly thank the engagement by the um, audience that was joining us by uh, through the internet. Um, this is an important topic. You heard today that we really need to figure out a way to be able to move this forward. This is uh, supposed to be a momentum building activity. And so I really appreciate the support that we have from the AIUM and from the Focused Ultrasound Foundation 
in initiating initiating this workshop series and and strongly encourage everyone um, to join us next week, uh, be able to put your thoughts in on the directions that the field should be going related to uh, bubble activity monitoring for therapeutic ultrasound. This is a critical topic and we really need everyone's participation in moving the field forward. So thank you very much and we hope to see you again uh, next week. Thanks.